Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar, where we get to sit down and talk with interesting professional guitar players and related music industry experts. If you love playing guitar, stick around. You're in the right place. Hey, this is Craig Garber. When I'm not interviewing world-class guitar players, I'm busy helping clients with their marketing. In fact, since March of 2000, I've helped over 300 clients in 108 different industries all over the world sell everything from $20 books to $5,000 seminar seats and everything in between. I even authored a marketing book called How to Make Maximum Money with Minimum Customers. And now I'm giving away a free marketing strategy session to business owners who qualify. On this call, we'll discuss what's currently working in your business, specific sales and marketing problems you're struggling with, and I'll identify specific strategies you can use to overcome these problems and increase your cash flow. To find out if you qualify and to book your free marketing strategy session with me, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing right now. Again, to book your free marketing strategy session with me, go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash marketing right now. Thanks for listening. Now let's get on with the show. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber. I just want to let you know there is a clicking sound on the first four and a half to five minutes of this audio. It clears up after that. This is a great interview with Arlen Roth. I know you're going to enjoy it. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for your understanding. And I'll see you on the inside. Hey, everybody. This is Craig Garber from Everyone Loves Guitar. And I've got just a real special guest uh, with us today. He's an incredible player. And he's a guy who actually literally revolutionized a component of the music industry and its ability to teach and reach individual guitar players at home. We're here with Arlen Roth. He's toured and recorded with major acts like Simon and Garfunkel, Bob Dylan, John Prine, Phoebe Snow, Levon Helm, Ry Cooter, John Sebastian, Janice Ian, Eric Anderson, the Bee Gees, and like literally hundreds more. He, uh, he developed a company called Hot Licks Video, which was basically a pioneer in the music and guitar education all over the world. His videos have sold in excess of 2.5 million copies. His current online lessons and blogs for Gibson have over 1 million followers. And he was also the man behind the legendary blues film Crossroads, creating the guitar parts and directing the scenes and working alongside Ry Cooter and Ralph Macchio for seven months in Mississippi and L.A. We'll talk a little bit about this today. He was also voted in the top 50 acoustic guitarists of all time by Gibson.com and in the top 100 most influential guitarists of all time by Vintage Guitar Magazine. He's got eight best-selling books to his credit, and his book Hot Guitar is a compilation of 10 years of his wildly popular column for Guitar Player Magazine of the same name. From 2007 to 2012, Arlen was also the creator of over 1,000 online lessons and blogs for Gibson Guitars. His first published book was called Slide Guitar, and that was on Oak Publications when he was only 21 years old. He's since published numerous well-known books. His first album, called Guitarist, won the Montreux Critics Award for Best Instrumental Album of the Year in 1978, and his 12th album, All Tricked Out, garnered four Grammy nominations. His prowess on the Telecasters earned him the name Master of the Telecaster and also is a master of the slide guitar. And he released a slide guitar summit album featuring duets with many slide guitar players like Johnny Winter, which is Johnny's last recording, actually. Sonny Landris, Cindy Cashdollar, Greg Martin, Leroy Parnell, Jimmy Vivino, David Lindley, Rick Vito, Jack Pearson, and loads of others. Those are all top, top, top performers. On other albums, he's played with Danny Gatton, Dwayne Eddy, Brian Setzer, Duke Robillard, Albert Lee, Sam Bush, Jerry Douglas, Levon Helm, Amy Helm, Lexi Roth, and Bill Kirchin. Arlen, there's no, uh, you're like, this is like home run after home run after home run. You're, but, well, keep on going, keep on going. <laughs> A-list only. His latest album, which is coming out in about two weeks, well, by the time this comes out, it'll be out. It's called Telemasters. It's an album mostly recorded in Nashville, featuring Arlen in duets with other Telecaster masters such as Brad Paisley, Vince Gill, Steve Cropper, Steve Warner, Joe Bonamassa, Brent Mason, Albert Lee, Johnny Hyland, Jerry Donahue, Will Ray, Red Volkart, Bill Kirchin, and Jack Pearson. Arlen's also the founder and CEO of the new International Guitar Hall of Fame and Museum, which has been a longtime dream of his that he hopes to become a reality. Man, thank you so very much for coming on the show. Sure, my pleasure, and it's great to be here. And 
like you say, everybody loves guitar, right? We <laughs> yeah. love it. We love it. And on my quest to interview every professional guitar player from the Bronx, I had to make sure I got you in the in the queue. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Everybody loves Bronx guitar players. That's especially. right. <laughs> but doesn't that include? Doesn't that also include Ace Freely? Is he Ace from the Bronx? Yeah, I think he is. Yeah. He's from Pelham Bay area. I'm pretty sure. And uh, wherever you know, he is, he's from the part of the Bronx where they talk like that. <laughs> <laughs> this is true, man. Um, but yeah. as I said, you were born in the Bronx, and your dad was New Yorker magazine cartoonist Al Ross, yes. which yes. is really awesome. I was curious. Oh, what, the greatest. What kind of what was your childhood like, and what kind of an influence did your dad have on your music career, your creativity, and otherwise? Uh, very huge influence. I mean, he was one of the greatest men of all time. In fact, he he not only really mentored me in my life, but our whole street in the Bronx developed all kinds of artists and, and creative people, all because of what they saw in him and his relationship to his kids. Because we always had him around. He was a freelance guy. They thought he was a bookie. You know, they thought he was like, you know. Because <laughs> he was always but, home. Yeah, back in the day, you didn't work out of your house. Right. Always, always, uh, exactly. He's always home. An artist. Always dressing really sharp, you know. He looked like Basil Rathbone. In fact, people always thought he was Basil Rathbone. And they'd come up for his autograph and he'd say, oh, thank you. I'm Al Ross from the New Yorker. <laughs> but... You know, unbelievable humor. We grew up with this amazing sense of humor. Everything was a potential gag for the New Yorker magazine or for another cartoon. And he he was a huge influence because, you know, I always had him around. He would take me to the the museums in the city every week. We'd go to the Bronx Zoo every weekend, which was around the corner. Uh, and, of course, you know, the whole family were artists. And I, had a, I have a brother who's 10 years older than me, David Roth, also a great visual artist, but he had kind of um, uh, taken my dad in for his own self in terms of the visual arts. Uh, so, and I was also a great visual artist, you know, photography and drawing and painting, but my dad would, would play these flamenco records in the house and he would dance around, dancing in the apartment, you know, my mother would be like, there he goes again, you know, he's at it again. And he'd be there, ole, ole. <laughs> and I, he's going through like his, his Picasso period. And so I, I'd start to pick things up. I'd start to pick things up off of, off of those records on guitar. You know, we had a guitar with two strings on it, a Stella. <laughs> so I just was doing little two-string harmonies. I was seven or eight years old. And he said to me, you know, Arlen, he said, I just see you playing the guitar. He says, you're going to be a guitar player one day. And I just know it. And he didn't have any particular, nobody in the family ever had an ear. I mean, they could never tell the difference between the downstairs bell or the upstairs bell in our apartment. Right. I said, can't you tell the difference? You know, it's like, it's like six tones different. But nobody had the ear. But I had, I channeled it all towards the ear and the feeling and the emotion. And, you know, he, he was Al Ross because I had four, there's four brothers who all became cartoonists, four Roth brothers. Oh so it was Ben Roth, Salo, who just used his first name, Salo, S-A-L-O, Irving Rohr, which is R-O-I-R, -R, and then Al Ross. So they all became cartoonists. You know, fantastic people, amazing. It was like the Ritz brothers or the Marx brothers, you know. And um, How random is know, that, that four brothers, I mean, all became... Well, right, think. Right. Look at Ark Rum. Look at Ark Rum. They all became. Yeah, that's right. They all started to. Yeah. But they really were mentally. Yeah, delayed, yeah, that's. You know? Yeah. But, little, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> that's another thing. I don't know if you ever saw that that incredible documentary. I best. did. Phenomenal. That phenomenal. But uh, we we like live. We know every line from that documentary. But my dad um, was the the only one that really gained real artistic success from the cartooning. He was really the best of the bunch. Although he'd always say, my brother Irving, he's the funniest one. He, you know, he'd always defer to someone else. But you know, they were, when they were playing soccer in the 1930s in Harlem, they once, they, of course they were great soccer players. They used to play on the Arcoa team, the uh, Jewish team, which was really based out of Europe, you know. But they would play in New York, they'd play Yankee Stadium, 
Oh, wow. You know, Edwards Field, Polo Grounds. I mean, he was a great athlete. So um, one day they all won an award. They won these four medals because they won the championship. And so Uncle Irving, the oldest one, said, come on, let's, uh, let's melt them all down and we'll have one big Roth medal. <laughs> okay, Irving, whatever you say. So then they're standing there in the apartment with this pan, and then they end up with a big blob of bronze. <laughs> and they said, you know, that's it. That's the end of our, our uh, soccer career. Now we're going to go on to, uh, to, to, to actually being cartoonists. And they all did. They all became cartoonists all at the same time. That's really cool, man. Very good story. It's wild. You grew up also during a time of great change, both musically and culturally. And I was curious, what are some of your fondest memories experiencing these times in New York City? Um, you know, for example, like maybe what was the scene in Greenwich Village like at the time and stuff like that? Yeah. Well, Greenwich Village was great because I, I started, uh, even though I'm a self-taught guitar player, I did start with a few lessons in the village. I was playing violin. Uh, and then my dad said, look, let's go down to the village. And we saw this really cool woman uh, named Shirley Dewald. And she started giving me lessons. I was 10. So these were also more great, great moments of being with my dad. Yeah. Then the whole thing was he tried to take lessons with me at the same time. So he said, well, after the open string arpeggio, they lost me. You know. <laughs> so, but he was really just into having me play the guitar. and then That was very cool of him, though, to try to take oh, Yeah, how cool is that? Yeah, he was so cool. You know. Well, he wanted to really be a Spanish gypsy, you know? <laughs> and so he would, uh, but he was a Romanian gypsy is what he was. But we, um, we would go then in the village, we'd go to our favorite deli and get a great sandwich, you know? And all the waitresses had, like, the painted on eyebrows with the high hair. I mean, real bohemian, you know... Thing. And he would immerse himself in that. And we'd go around, we'd go to record shops. And um, he just, he knew that the heartbeat of what really would mean something to me would be in Manhattan. You know, we lived in the Bronx. The best thing about the Bronx was I could get a good egg cream <laughs> and a corned beef sandwich or whatever. The rest of it I really didn't like at all. I, I, I liked Bronx Park. I played in the Little League and all that. And I pitched no hitters and all that stuff. I had an undefeated year of. 12 and 0 with a no hitter, and I got to, I won a ticket to go see To Kill a Mockingbird, you know, uh, when it was just coming out. Great movie. So that, that was my, what a great movie. And so I, um, he would always take me into Manhattan. And so we started, you know, when I started falling in love with the guitars, he'd go to these guitar shops with me, you know, and he'd say, look how beautiful we see. You know, he appreciated the aesthetic beauty of them. Mm. And we, I remember being at Dan Armstrong's first shop on 48th Street, which was upstairs, just when the vintage guitar boom hit. Mm. You know, just, i say about 66, 67. And we were literally walking over, you know, sunburst Les Pauls that were all lying on the floor, oh just God. making sure we wouldn't step on them. You know, we would go to these little shops, obscure shops, and try to buy stuff and and we find out that Dan Armstrong would move in the next day and buy it all when we had just missed it for an hour, you know. But I was still a kid. And then, you know, being on 48th Street with him when I got my first electric guitar when I was 11. And who's in the store? With Charlie Watts. Holy crap. And I knew right away who he was, you know. So I asked him for his autograph. I remember my dad pushed me. He said, no, go ahead. Go over and ask him. Ask him. Because I already had a Stones album. And it, it, it's hard to not recognize Charlie Watts, in my opinion. Yeah, he's a yeah. very distinct look. Yeah, Very distinct face, that stony face. And he, he already looked 100 to me. You know what I mean? <laughs> he's probably about 24. Yeah. But I, uh, I, so I went over and he wrote Charlie Watts of the Rolling Stones. So, because they were playing their first gig that night, he was there like trying out sticks in this little tiny shop called Ben's Music on 48th Street, which was when I saw music stores in London later, I realized why he went into there because it was like a little crowded English shop, yeah, yeah. not big manny's. He wanted something a little bit more intimate. So, when I was telling this story on the radio in England on BBC, many years later, I think in 1988 or 89. 
They called up. They said, you were the first child that ever recognized Charlie. He couldn't believe, he said, you were such a charming little boy that you would recognize. And I said, I didn't know that until this moment. I just thought, well, there's one of the Rolling Stones. I'm going to get his autograph. Everybody knows them, you know. Yeah, yeah. But he said, I was the first kid ever to, he felt so great that I knew who he was. That's so I cool. I didn't even say, like, are you, I just said, can I have your autograph? Yeah, like yeah. That. And they said, you're a charming little boy. And, and so a couple of his, he didn't come, but a couple of his guys came down to my gig that night in London. I was doing a clinic at a place, I think it was in Chiswick, London, that sex, section of London. It was a pub somewhere, and I was giving clinics and pubs, and, uh, which is just such a pleasure, you know. And um, that was really exciting. So I'll never forget that moment. And, uh, but we used to go down there. I mean, I go down to 48th Street with my dad on a regular basis, you know, I mean, all the time. And after that first initial Japanese guitar, then I had gotten a Guild guitar. And then in 67, I put in an order because I had the Gibson catalog. Like, wow, an actual catalog. I think, okay. And I, I liked the way the Birdland looked. So I ordered a Birdland, which took six months to come in. It came in in the, it came in in the wrong color. Uh, and I got it. Me and my dad went to, you know, Manny's. And the guy's like, come on, man, this is a thousand dollar axe, man. A thousand dollar, you know, we already had four hundred dollars on it, so I understood it was a thousand dollar axe, but it was the wrong, it wasn't an I wanted one in natural finish. This one was the ugly sunburst, like mm. black and yellow spotlight, and it was already by, by that time the quality had really gone down. That's really? why vintage, oh, yeah, vintage guitars were like really coming on, and like a new Birdland, a 67, you know. So I played it, I bent the note, and the nut popped right out of the guitar. <laughs> right out. And I said, listen, you know, so we ended up getting our money back. I said, I don't like this guitar anyway. And then we went around the corner to a store called Eddie Bell, which was on 40, either 47 or 40, I think it was 49th Street. Went upstairs. And there, and I, I looked at stuff, and they said, no, no. And the guy said, have you seen our 52 Les Paul? I said, oh, no, I haven't. And they just took it out of, actually, out of a glass case. Even in 1967, they had a glass display case. And I played it, and I was immediately in love. I said, now, there's a quality guitar. It was in 1952, the first year, and, uh, you know, gold top. And it was $300 less than the Birdland, which was, we were getting the Birdland at seven fifty. so the less, less ball was 500 Was that with so, the P90s? Yeah, the P90s, yeah. gold top, the trapeze. I still have it, still have the guitar. Oh, wow. And, and we were like, I was, that changed everything, you know. And right at that, that time, I was very much into the blues, and I loved Mike Bloomfield. Oh, yeah. I loved, um, you know, Buddy, BB, all about Otis Rush. I was just, you know, you, you get so deeply immersed in those guys. Because you know, one leads to the other, leads to the other. You know, within two days, you're like listening to Sun House and Robert Johnson. You know? <laughs> so I was like, and I went to the High School of Music and Art in New York, which was a very, even though I was an art student, uh, we were all great musicians. You know, we all brought our guitars to school and we jam all the time. Even after school, we'd go to people's houses and jam and jam and jam and listen to records. And, you know, we were learning so much at that time. So, was that back great, on? Great, uh, yeah, great time. Was that up on 135th Street and Convent Avenue back then still? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's not there anymore. No. I'm sure they were promising us that we were going to be in Lincoln Center, you know. It ended up being like about 28 years later. Yeah. <laughs> That's so but, cool, but, man. Yeah. Was, so we'd go up there. I would take, you know, I'd go down uh, Fordham Road. I'd take the bus. Then I'd take the D train. Yeah. Then I'd take the CC train. Yeah. The CC rider. <laughs> right. The local, you know, I got accosted several times. At one time, I, 
you know, it was, it was scary. You know, yeah, that was, was a rough like, area back in the day. It was rough, and 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 music and art had to be on different schedules. So I my school didn't start till 10 a.m. Mm. I'd be going through those dark train stations at the age of 14 and stuff with nobody around. And the one time a guy pulled me behind the stairway there and was gonna like like you know rape me or something. Really strange thing. But he was drunk and I just kind of like uh, I stuck with him. I said, come on, come on the train with me. Train came in, we went on the train together. And then just when the doors were about to close at 135th Street, I bolted out. Holy shit. Just when he just when he released his grip on me, you know. So after but it was you know, you'd go through stuff going up there at that time, you know. Yeah, it was rough. I auditioned for that. I played saxophone as a kid and I remember same thing as you, I was fourteen years old and I was really chubby as a kid and I'm carrying this giant like luggage, you know, my tenor sax, yeah. and I was scared shitless. And you had to walk up like a thousand steps. To, oh. And I was in the yeah. train, and oh, same yeah. as you, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, the train's I got, empty. Sure. I got robbed on those steps. Yeah. Time. I'm not surprised. That was a bad I, area I, back in the day. I would give, I, one time I gave some guys some money just so they would stop beating up this other kid that was, uh, they were taking his glasses off and smashing him and everything. I said, look, I'll give you 10 bucks now if you just leave him alone. <laughs> <laughs> you're setting up an annuity <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it was like it came yeah that's right that train was down on uh saint nicholas or no, whatever it was yeah, yeah saint nicholas avenue and the te- and then you walked up to all those steps yeah the beautiful area I yeah mean, you had all those wonderful brownstones there that's like where like you know duke ellington lionel hampton all those kind of people they lived that yeah. was like the really intense part of Harlem with the beautiful brownstones. Yeah. That's funny, man. Hey, so yeah. what, what prompted you to move to Woodstock? And, and when you went up there, what was the music scene like at that time up in Woodstock? Oh, it was great. Well, I was 16 and I had a band called Steel. And we were from White Lake, New York. Okay. Me and the drummer were from White Lake, which is where the Woodstock Festival was. I, I went up there every summer. You know, the Borscht Belt. There was the Wasserman Roth bungalow colony. And we were, that was my Uncle Irving. It was his bungalow colony. So we would st- we went there from like 1952 when I was born all the way to the, uh, I guess, probably to the early 90s. And so we were playing, and I, I knew, I was already in school, college in Philadelphia, and my band was living with me. So we were playing all kinds of gigs in Philly. We would do these wonderful block parties. Um, we had thousands of people every night. We would like section off. You could just section off an area in Philly and just start playing. And they had no problem with that. And I remember when Frank Rizzo was running for mayor, he said, and we're going to stop those rock and roll concerts downtown. And he's talking about us. You know, but we would have like, oh, I mean, I learned so much during that time, just growing right in front of those audiences, you know, needing to communicate and playing my own music, which was very freeform at that time, you know. I still do some of those songs now in my set, like there's a a song I always end with called The Upstate Red. The first time we ever played The Upstate Red was at the, we did the Woodstock Revival, 1970. We got, we got a flatbed truck, we got a sound system. We even recorded. There's a recording of this. And uh, we played for about 40,000 people at the Woodstock site. We came to celebrate the first anniversary. We were the only band. So we played four hours each day. Holy crap. And we were like a power trio. You know, one of the guys was Sandy Berman, my late great friend. He played uh, a large, like a RMI electric piano. And he would play the bass lines with his left hand. You know, which is not an uncommon thing in those days to not have a real bass player. Right. But uh, but we we did that, and uh, then I I started knowing and finding out that the town of Woodstock had this great scene going on. You know, so we would go up there after school, or like I, as if I went to school. I didn't really go to school, <laughs> but but I was living in Philly. Let's put it that way: living in Philly with my band and occasionally going to school. Mostly spending my time in the pawn shops looking for guitars, <laughs> and with no money, you know. 
but we would drive up. My my drummer had the archetypical, uh, you know, VW bus. And we would go all the way up to Woodstock. I don't know how we even made it. That's a hell of a trip from Philly. That's not. Yeah, it's uh, you know. It's about it was what, like nine, ten hours. I guess so. I don't know if it's that long, but in the VW bus, maybe it was that long. <laughs> it felt like we were like in a with a lawnmower, you know. But um, <laughs> such a small engine. But the um, I would go up and um, sit in with people. And in fact, one time. We went to a club there called the Sled Hill Cafe, which is a really cool little club. And Buzzy Feeton was playing there with a band wow. that he had called Bang. And I already knew who Buzzy Feeton was from Paul Butterfield, you know. And so I said, hey, listen, man, can we, you guys are on a break now. Can my band come up and play and use your stuff? Just play a couple of tunes. He said, sure, you know, no problem. Just be careful, be careful, you know. I had my Les Paul with me, but I went through his hand. So we went up, and I remember we had to stand on crates because the, the place was flooded, and we would have gotten electrocuted if we had stood in the water. So we're standing there on, on milk cartons performing, and I remember, you know, Paul Butterfield was sitting at the bar, and he goes, of course, I wanted to be heard by Butterfield. Of course. And like, Okay, Butterfield, that's like, he's the John Mayall of America. You know, yeah. like I want to, I love Mike Bloomfield. I love all the guys he's had in his band. And I, and Butterfield's going, hey, you hear this kid? You hear this young kid up there? And he's talking to like somebody else. And I'm thinking, great, he's taking notice of me, you know. And I was still, maybe I was 17 at this point. Uh, but what happened was uh, we kept on, doing that kind of stuff, and then people started taking a liking to us and wanting to book us, so we started doing gigs up there while I was still, again, in school, but on the weekends, and I realized that this is where I was headed, you know, because there was a guy, Tony Brown, bass player, who I've recently reconnected with again. He, at that time, he was playing with Happy and Artie Traum. Hmm. <clears throat> so he sees me play at the club, he comes up and goes, uh, he's like a dark, brooding kind of guy, you know. He's like, like you ever hear Happy and Artie Trump? I'm like, yeah, you know. Well, I play bass with him. Like, oh, okay. You know. Like, Happy and Artie Trump, for most people, it's not a big deal. But at that time, anybody who made a record, who actually recorded him with yeah, a yeah. to me, that was such a big thing. I was a teenager, you know. I'm like, really? He said, well, come on, you know. I'm going to form a band, and we're all going to live in Woodstock. Um, and we're going to rehearse. We have already a barn where we're going to rehearse. It was kind of like a thing that was like what the band was doing. Sure. You know, <clears throat> in Sorgades. It was even in Sorgades near Big Pink. Mm -hmm. You know. So um, I did. I moved up there the following year. I left school. I missed a good part of school because I came down with a bad case of mono. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, that was, you, you got that a lot back then. That was not uncommon. Oh, it was terrible. And so I, um, I came back six months later after summer. And that summer I played with my band all summer long, and I was writing a lot of music. So that illness and being away from school it kind of like made me think more of like, you know what, I'm really going to go head first into music and not be so involved in photography because at that time I was really in love with photography and film as well. That's why I was going to school there. Um, that was mostly because of my brother's influence. You know, my brother, ten years older than me, an artist. All the time, I was trying to like follow in his footsteps. Sure. So, um, but everybody could see that music was my thing. You know? so, and your folks were um, cool with you dropping out of school and moving up to Woodstock. Oh yeah, they were. They were like, do whatever you want. You know, like when my mom. I remember when. My mom left me at the apartment there in Woodstock where I just back. It was like I literally had a room that was so small you couldn't open the door to the place <laughs> without hitting the couch. You know? <laughs> and she, she shed like a little tear. She had like a tear running down her face. And I, I only had that place for one year because that band quickly fell apart. But my connection with Tony Brown, that bass player, kept on going. And then we played a lot together with Happy and Artie mm. and other people like Eric Anderson mm. and 
John Harold, who was a singer up there who was with the Green Briar Boys, a great singer. Um, so I started working with people from the Woodstock scene, you know, and and you meet, you know, Butterfield, start hanging out with Butterfield, start hanging out with, you know, running into Rick Danko and people like that, and it was just amazing. And and then you, I'd be there one night in the winter time, and like the band's album, I think it was Cahoots, came out, and you know, you'd go into a bar in Woodstock, and it was just packed with people. And the whole thing was listening to the new album, you know, like wow, everybody that's, listening. That's almost like an outer space to yes. bring that today. That's almost, you know, absurd. I know. It's kind it of sad, it was, though, because it is sad. Yeah, very that, sad. Because how cool is that when you get a bunch of people that are sort of like like minded, living in the same area, into the same stuff. And you're all community. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that, like, that vibe still carries on there. In Woodstock. Yeah. Yeah. I was talking to Cindy Cash Dollar about that this morning. She says, well, you know, she grew up there and then she moved back. Yeah, and yeah. Right, right. She said to me, you know, come on, man, you got to come back. You got to come back here. You got to live here again. You know, you got to do it. And, of course, I play differently when I'm up there. It's amazing. I just I, do. I thought you lived there now. No, no, no. I'm in Connecticut now. Oh, okay. I only live, I only actually live, physically lived in Woodstock one year. Oh. But after that, I became a big part of the scene, so I was always taking buses and trains and this and that. Um, but I, I was living in the Bronx and also living in in Manhattan too. But back and forth with Woodstock, you know, okay. a lot. I even did my first album up there, um, at the uh, you know Bearsville Studio. Sure, yeah. Um, which yeah. Artie Tran had produced. I actually recorded that in 76, but it didn't come out until 78. That's the one that won the Montreux yeah. Award. Because it was originally going to be a duet album between me and Artie Traum, but then it became uh, just Arlen Roth solo. You know? um, so, And then I did Hot Pickups, which followed up that one, which was also a big, pretty big hit, actually, that album. At least on the radio. I only got paid $13, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, big, big, that's, hey, that's that's, that's that's more than you might make if you release your album today and it gets a hundred thousand plays right. on Spotify. That's right. 000, that's, right. <laughs> and that's with it being tracked, you know. <laughs> but I know it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. You might be it's saying, "Shit, I wish I could get that thirteen <laughs> bucks back again." <laughs> it's amazing though, but you know, when I do my gigs, people leave with like five or six CDs. Hmm. You know, I'll sell a hundred CDs at a gig, no problem. Great, it's amazing. I always say that's the world's biggest record store, you know. It might um, be the only it, record store. It might be the only. I feel like, <laughs> and I'm selling my vinyls. Like the new Telemasters album is going to be a double vinyl album as well. It'll be CD with a double vinyl with downloads because it's got 16 songs. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, I think it's 16, maybe even 17. I don't know. But, um, you know, but yeah, yeah, there's, so, there's no music stores on 48th Street now. You know that. I know that's very sad. Literally very sad. zero. I know. I know. I, um, Sam Ash is down on 34th, I think, over on the west side. Yeah. And then, you know, Guitar Rudy Center's has, like 14th Street or something like that on the well, west Guitar side. Guitar Center, that's... Yeah, that's a, that's not really a music... I don't consider... That's that, another story. That's like a Caldor that sells instruments. It's not really a music yeah, it's, store. It's, we, want, we walked into one here recently, and I said... This place has no soul. No. So you can feel it. You can feel that it has no soul. I couldn't wait to get out of there. Yeah. It, it's like. I don't, uh, want, I don't want Guitar Center to hear that. Yeah, yeah. It's like <laughs> Neiman Marcus, but they happen to sell instruments or something like that, you know, maybe even more stoic <laughs> than that. I know. It's crazy. But I'll, yeah. That's re- so you had. Let me. I'm, you've worked with so many people. So I'm going to throw three names sure. out. And if you could talk about how the uh, relationship came about, like, you know, how the gig came about. And if you have a cool or interesting story about working with them. Um, oh, there's plenty of those. Oh, I know. I can <laughs> literally sit here for hours and hours with you. Uh, let's talk Bob Dylan first. Well, Bob Dylan was a simple thing. I mean, <clears throat> I, I I got called by Eric Anderson <clears throat> and he said, Erlen, and he had his, like, Buffalo accent, Erlen, the, the survivors of the 70s are going to be decided tonight. 
I said, what do you mean the survivors of this? <laughs> he spoke in a very, you know, it was like you'd be in the middle of a conversation or something. I said, well, he said, just come down to Gertie's Folk City with me. You'll see something big is going to happen. I said, okay. So I brought like a little tiny pig nose ant mm. because I didn't think there was going to. I had to take the subway. Pig nose ant, I had my, my newly purchased 53 telly. And I go to Gertie's Folk City. And sure enough, uh, all of a sudden these people are setting up big lights and they're putting a, a mic in front of my amp. And I'm going, what's going on here? It feels like something's going to happen. All of a sudden, Dylan walks in. And it was the uh, surprise announcement of the Rolling Thunder tour, <clears throat> which was disguised as a birthday party for Ma Mike Porco, who owned that club, who gave Dylan his first New York gig. So Dylan had to borrow, I had my Martin, I had a triple O eighteen Martin that I bought from Ry Cooter. This is 1975, 76. And, and so was Dylan in, went, where was Gertie's? Was that in the village? Gertie's Gertie's Folk City in the village. Okay. Um, G E R D E S. And um, the only two times I ever was walked into that club, I ended up in two movies. The other time was when I was playing with Eric Weisberg in Deliverance, and it was a private party for the Hell's Angels. Nice. And this guy stood in front of us cracking a whip. He said, Dueling banjos. <laughs> and like, as long as I had the guitar, I'm like, you're okay, brother. You're fine, brother. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that had to be a little that ended up in a, <laughs> that ended up being in a movie. So then the Dylan thing, Dylan borrows my Martin. And he goes, no strap? He's no strap. I said, no, no strap, Bob. And because I sat when I played. And Joan Baez said something to me about, like, you're going to be sorry you lent it to him or something. And sure enough, he put, like, a big belt buckle scratch on the guitar, which I was always very proud of. Yeah. I'd show it. I'd say, yeah, Dylan made this scratch on my guitar. And so they sang Happy Birthday. And then the next thing you know, I backed everybody. It turned into this crazy night, which I'm, I'm putting in my book because I have such perfect recollection of it all. And I played with Phil Oaks, and it was like the last time Phil Oaks ever performed. Wow. Uh, and he was like, Bob, don't leave, Bob, Bob. Bob was like walking out with Phil Oaks, you know, with his entourage. And Dylan was like, I'll be right back, right back. Yeah. And he, did, he didn't come back. And Oaks was like, please, Bob, don't leave. I mean, he stopped in the middle of his song, said, don't leave, you know. And Roger McGuinn and Patty Smith and uh, and I'm up there. Allen Ginsberg is deciding he's going to recite poetry, and I'm backing him up too. Oh my god! You know, god. three four. This is this great night, you know. And Bette Midler shows up. The next thing, I'm playing behind her. And uh, I remember even in the early days of T-Bone Burnett was playing piano. I'm like, who's this guy? You know? And David Mansfield on on. Uh, violin and mandolin that's the first time we met but that's really the only time dylan was one time i just was playing and playing on stage and had my eyes closed for a long time and i opened my eyes and dylan is like right smack dab in front of me go quelling you know the jewish expression quelling he's just going like this with his eyes in his head he's just totally immersed in what watching me play and he had all his people around him too bobby newworth saying this is the guy man because New Earth was, ha when I was playing with John Prime the year before, New Earth was sort of hanging out with us too. And that was like Bob Dylan's court jester, you know, Bobby New Earth, his, his friend and whatever. But New Earth was there. So, you know, I did that whole Dylan thing and that was, but that, that ended up, of course, in the, oh yeah, Ramblin' Jack Elliott. I played with Jack Elliott that night. So if you see the movie Ronaldo and Clara, Unfortunately, they cut a lot of that scene out, that, that party. That party alone would have been the whole movie. But um, you see me and Jack Elliott uh, doing a song together. It's really nice. Because so I knew Jack. I knew Jack from the, also from the John Prine. You know, when I was playing with Prine, I mean, Prine was really hooked up with a lot of different people. We were hanging out with everybody. Randy Newman, Jack Elliott, Leon Redbone, um, all these great people that would be with us, Bonnie Ray, you know, Bonnie would be there on the bus with us, you know, and so we were just all like a little traveling band of gypsies 
back then with, with John Prime, because you know, he was starting to really happen. Was like back in, in that scene, was like weed a constant thing throughout that, or yes and no? Or no, no, more like coke was a thing. Right? Really? Oh, yeah. Now, and I didn't know anything about it. I just stayed away from it. Yeah. But I didn't understand it, or what was going on. Yeah, well, and it's I was probably like, to your benefit. 22 years old, and I was just missing my girlfriend back home. And meanwhile, there's groupies everywhere. And I mean, I was like, you know, it, it, it hit me kind of up. I had never been on the road like that. I'd mm. been on the road in, you know, upstate New York and the Northeast with like a lot of the folk acts. Mm. But when I was with Prime, that was like a hardcore, like seven month tour. You know, also before that, the Bee Gees. Mm. That was two weeks that felt like seven months. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Everybody was everybody was sick on the bus, and uh, you know, and also you know it was Canada, so the venues were like you know seventeen hours apart. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So far apart. So, um, but that then that really oh I got really sick on that tour. Everybody was sick on that bus, but there were beds where some of the old musicians because it was the orchestra that backed up the Bee Gees were were like lying there in bed sick but um you know the prime thing was a hardcore tour because we um the tour was supposed to be the summer the 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 north in the summer and the south in the winter instead we ended up doing the south in the summer and the north in the winter and we i remember going to ronnie hawkins house in uh, in canada in, in ontario and it must have been like 12 below zero and he was out there on a tractor trying to start his tractor with icicles hanging off of his beard, you know. And I had just bought this triple O eighteen Martin from Ry Cooter in LA and I left it left it in the bus overnight in that uh, freezing cold. And it survived. It was fine. I said, Well, if this guitar had survived that, it's already it's gonna you know, it'll be good. You still have um, it? No, I sold that. That ended up getting uh there was a problem with it, but I had it for about 24 years it was my number one best acoustic guitar i've ever owned you know by far okay let's talk about simon and garfunkel next because to me as a kid growing up in new york and you know i guess my primary years were the 70s whatever they represent new york as the quintessential band i mean this the stuff yeah. they cranked out during that period of time was just Abs- yeah, uh, crazy, incredible. you know, yeah. so prolific. They were great, you know. I mean, I remember being a young kid uh, on Bol- Bolton Street. I grew up in a street called Bolton Street. Bolton Street. Street. Yeah, right near the Globe Theater. That was there on Pelham Parkway. And, oh, wait a minute. The Globe Theater on Pelham Parkway. A block from White Plains Road. Okay, yeah, yeah. I know exactly yeah. where that is. Okay, I know exactly. Right on the par- edge of the park. Yep. And so... I remember, you know, listening to Simon and Garfunkel um, on the street there and showing this girl that I really liked in my building. I had just gotten this Favilla classical guitar, showing her the guitar and hearing Simon and Garfunkel at the same time and uh, talking about them. She said, yeah, really funny name, that Simon. (laughs) And then, like, you know, I remember telling the story to a crowd because I recently played with Garfunkel at the synagogue in in uh, Scarsdale, I did like a benefit concert with him. So he had me telling all these stories to the audience. He basically handed the show over to me. And I did all, all the Simon and Garfunkel stuff instrumentally, and he was standing off of the side of the stage. Um, but, um, uh, you know, what happened, the way the whole thing started with them was... In 19, I guess it was in 72 or 3, his brother, Eddie, are you aware of Eddie Simon? No. Okay. Eddie Simon, he looks exactly like Paul. Uh, Really looks just like Paul. Maybe he's two inches taller. Um, And I think think he's Paul's younger brother, but they're so, they almost look like twins. So, in fact, one day I played uh, tennis with him at a place in Queens, and these two Japanese guys came up to us in the dressing room, and they said, Paul Simon, can we have your autograph, please? <laughs> he goes, 
I'm sorry, I'm his brother Eddie. Uh, we all, you know, I look a lot like him. I get that all, and they turn to me and just go, "Are you Garfunkel's brother?" <laughs> <laughs> so of course, we hang out of together. Course. Simon and Garfunkel's <laughs> brothers. Here we are. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, uh, right. I said every time funny. I tell that story to Paul, that's the only thing I can always get him to crack up about that. <laughs> Simon and Garfunkel's brothers hang out. Are you, are you, I said thanks a lot, and you all look alike too. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, so anyway, so Eddie Simon had a place in Manhattan called the Guitar Study Center, and it was in a very fancy area like Madison Avenue and like 60th Street or 65th Street. Um, and I would teach there. I had a slide guitar course. Now, who the hell taught slide guitar, right? Back so, in, when was it? Back in 72, when, 73. 72. So, yeah. And so I would have people hanging off the rafters. I mean, I have 100 people for every class every day. And Eddie would just sit there and say, man, there's just nobody that plays like you are. So he was always a big supporter of mine. So in about two years after, or maybe even three years, I get this phone call at like 8 o'clock in the morning, like, Arlen, this is Art Garfunkel. I'm like, you got to be kidding me, right? This is a joke. And he I cracked him up to, sure enough, it was Eddie had recommended me to Garfunkel. So you need a guitar player, call up Arlen. And what Eddie didn't even realize at that time was that I knew all the Simon and Garfunkel stuff cold. You know, I knew all of that. So I walked into Garfunkel's penthouse there on 72nd and 5th, and Artie told me later, he said, the minute I walked in, I had the gig. He just knew I was the guy. And you know, correct me if I'm what? wrong, he still lives there, correct? Yes, he still has that home. Yeah, right. And um, he has another place, another apartment too that he uses more as an office. Mm. Um, but I went there and I played with him and we had such a great time. And uh, I remember it was, a, it was a blizzard too and I carried like three guitars. Uh, to his place in a snowstorm, you know. Um, and he was there with his girlfriend at the time, Rory Bird. Um, and we uh, went through some stuff and, you know, I had the gig like that. At that time, I had the Billy Joel gig, but I didn't like that. Um, and I told, I, I had to decide between the two. And what I didn't like about the Billy Joel gig was the guitar was very in the background. Yeah. And he was just starting out. He had just uh, was about to re release a stranger, oh, which wow. I, ha I still have it on a cassette with as rough mixes. But I remember Billy Joel going, "What are we gonna do? This guy's really good. What are we gonna do now? This guy's really good." Because like, his band, they were all like his buddies, you know. So the guitar player was always sort of like the odd man out. And it was a, a nine-month tour, and it was the money wasn't nearly as good as the Garfunkel money. So I went with Garfunkel, and then in that was in '78, and then in '82, Paul Simon called me to. <clears throat> you know, I had met Paul Simon, and he had sat in with us a few times. In '82, he asked me to give him lessons. In 1982. In '82, so I started teaching Paul, which in the Brill Building, you know, which was very sure. exciting. Sure, on Broadway over there. Famous, yeah. And I would go up there and teach him, but it would, it would really turn into um, two or three hour songwriting things. Because he had me help him with his songs, a lot of the songs. The, the album that was supposed to be the Simon and Garfunkel reunion album ended up becoming just a Paul Simon album called Hearts and Bones. And about half of those songs are my ideas. You know, I, I wrote bridges, choruses. I would inspire him to do certain things. But he'd always be like, I'm stuck, I'm stuck. You know, I need you to... And so I'd come up with stuff that he would uh, use. I mean, I didn't get any credit on the bottom line where it really matters, but he would always credit me personally. He'd be like, there's there's Arlen's part, there's Arlen's section that he wrote, you know, like that. Yeah. Um, and then, then he called me for the tour. Now, this was... They did Central Park after that, I think? No, Central Park was 81. Okay. I and I was just in the audience. You know, like they had me, I, I was sitting in the VIP section. I remember I was right next to Caroline Kennedy. And um, so I'm there. But then the 83 Summer World Tour, 
that was the one that they called me for. You know what my favorite part, because I listen to that Central Park album probably once a year. My favorite part is when they say, I want to thank the little known people in New York that's making this possible. The guy selling loose joints. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's hilarious. You know, first he says, I want to thank Mayor Koch and everybody boos and the right. police department, everybody boos and the parks department is kind of like neutral. And then the, the guy selling loose joints and everybody just burst out, you know. And that must have been Garfunkel that said that. No, it was Paul Simon. Paul oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I don't I know. It was, it, was, it was Artie. I don't know. I don't know off the top of my head. Well, I think that's Artie. But yeah. I, I remember being there. And, uh, but yeah, we did that 83 tour. Um, which was very big, you know, and about seven months long, and we played all the ballparks. When I think back now on it, I think there's only like two of the ballparks we performed are even left standing. In the States here. In the States. And we played, you know, Switzerland, and we played France, we played Israel, we played this amazing stadium, a soccer stadium in Israel, in um, Tel Aviv. And then we got to see the whole country, you know, traveling around as, like a bunch of crazies. And next thing I know, that tour is over, and I'm suddenly in Scotland, and it's snowing, and it's, and I'm, I'm doing a clinic tour throughout Scotland, England, and all that, and Germany, and, you know, which is a whole other story. But, um, but it was, uh, those were amazing times, you know, and uh, that was when, Jillian was born when my first child was born, mm. and the Deborah was even on the road with us a, a couple of times um, when she was very, very pregnant. And one time she was up, she climbed all the way up to the, 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 the soundboard, which was in the middle of a stadium of like 70,000 people. And she was already about like seven months pregnant. I said, listen, that's it, man. You've got you, you've to go home. This is crazy, you know. And she would just climb up to be with the sound man, you know. She's up there. So I, uh, and we, we had some audiences that were really rowdy. I mean, it was a, a, a riot when we played France. At a Paul you know, Simon a, concert? Simon and Garfunkel. Oh, it was a Simon and Garfunkel concert. All right. That's what made it bad. No, <laughs> it, was, it was the, um, yeah, we're playing like Scarborough Fair and people are rioting. That's kind of weird. So, I said, at least it's not sympathy for the devil, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh no, but they're, they're, they're hitting each other with, with bottles of Avian water and throwing. And I said, that's like a $2 bottle in New York City. Don't throw that in. <laughs> so, but really, Paul Simon stopped. We stopped the show. He said, hey, if you stop. Because some cop in the front was like hitting somebody with like a billy club. And I really started to feel like I was at Altamont. Where was, and this yeah. is where, in Switzerland? This was in Nice, France. That's really weird that, that like, I could, a Metallica concert, you know, I could see it. Simon and Garfield, yes, not I mean, so much. You know it was? People were crushing. They were pushing each other. It's mob mentality. Hmm. And, I mean, yeah, really, we had people who would run on stage trying to tear our clothes off. And so it was crazy. It was, wow. I mean, they were icons of the 60s, you know. And so everything got kind of crazy. And when you're in Europe, you know, you never know. So you know, anywhere in America, we had problems in Boston. We were getting hit with those. Everybody was spinning around those stupid glow sticks, you know, and they were hitting us in the face. We were getting hit. Paul got hit right in the eye with one. So it's hazardous. You know, when you start to get up there in front of that many people, um, and then you even see down in the front, there's some people you know or you invited, and you see that they're starting to feel anxious because the crowd is pushing. You know, there's that mob mentality mm. that becomes, you know, it's like becomes one living object, and it's kind of scary, you know. But um, we 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 had a bunch of gigs, you know, played all the the nice old stadiums. I got to play baseball on the field too, <laughs> which was great, you know. Before the game, before yeah. the you know, concert, we we hit a few and throw it around. It was what a thrill, you know. And so I want to stand where Hank Aaron stood, you know, for all those years yeah. at County Stadium in Milwaukee, you know. It's, it was great stuff. So let's talk with last one. Um, Levon Helm. Amazingly oh, talented that's, 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 human being. Great. That, Levon Helm, that was the sense of like, okay, 
Now I know what it's like to be in a room with a world-class musician. I mean, like beyond world-class, you know, just like, like a, a, a nation unto himself, you know. Um, and the minute I walked in the studio, you know, it was like we were just being as friendly as can be. And, you know, he's like, uh, I was with this woman at the time. He's like, well, hey, come on, sweetheart. What you want to do? You know, come on. Because <laughs> yeah. right away, you know, I thought he was like hitting on her, you know. But, but she, I went to the bathroom. We didn't know if Levon was even going to try to sing or whatever. Most of the problems he had had with his throat. Sure. So this is this was was later. What what year was this? Uh, I think it came out in '07, so maybe it was early '07 or '06. So this was his last album. This is my album. Okay, this is on your this album. My album okay. called Tooling Around Woodstock. Okay. Because I had Tooling Around, and this was like a follow up to Tooling Around, like twenty years later or ten years later. Gotcha. Um, and Bill Kirchner's on that one as well, and so is Sonny Landry. And Amy Helm, his daughter, yeah. sang with my daughter Lexi Well. Oh, that's yeah. so cool. So it was really kind of nice. Amy's great. Amy's great. And Levon, I mean, I'm telling you, you know, I'm thinking, imagine how much care they put into their own music, the band. Because we're doing these sessions, and Levon's like, no, boys, we ain't got it yet. No, you got to listen to this tune. Come on, can we play that song? You're going to make sure that you learn it, you know? And, like, I had a couple of guys in the band that had never heard. We were doing Deep Feeling by Chuck Berry, the instrumental. The ba da ba da You know, I was doing that with Sonny Landry. We were cutting the track with Levon. Levon's like, no, you ain't got it. In fact, there's a, there's a clip on YouTube where you can see us running it down. And uh, that's fabulous. And and then, you know, the song's over. The song's over. And Levon goes, what was that, about a minute and a half? <laughs> minute and a half, you know. And But he was just so gracious and so wonderful and played so amazingly good. You know, every beat that he hits on the drum has its space and time. Like, you can set your watch by him. But the time is going like this. He's playing the drums with such feeling. It's just like a guitar player or anybody else in the band. It's all part of it, you know. And uh, that was like, what a thrill to record that stuff for him. You know, just incredible. Absolutely incredible. And even the fact that he even agreed to do it, you know, mm -hmm. was amazing. Um, luckily, I had somebody who was able to back that project. Because it was an expensive project to do. Yeah. Um, and, but you know, go up to that barn, and I, I've performed in that barn as well. Because we we did it right there in his barn. Right. You know, which has great sound. So. That um, was where he had the every Saturday night the the. Uh, the ramble. The ramble, right, right. And then you know he then he started singing. He says, "I, I want to sing Sweet Little Sixteen, and I want to sing Crying Time, which." My daughter Lexi was going to sing Cry in Time. So it ended up that Levon was going to sing Cry in Time. And Lexi ended up singing another song, Nightlife, the old Ray Price, mm. Willie Nelson yeah. blues thing, um, which Levon played on, you know. But you know, just absolutely uh, what an honor to work with him. It's, you know, can't even describe it. You know, and it's kind of that way now when I'm working with John Sebastian, you know. John Sebastian is one of those guys that because he meant so much when I was growing up that I'm still star tr starstruck. I know really? we're friends. Oh, yeah. I mean, because we're playing like, you know, Daydream. And we're playing, uh, you know, did you ever have to make up your mind? Right. And, you know, just these songs that were permeating the airwaves then that were so... I was, during my very formative time, I guess I was maybe about 13 or 14. Mm. So I was such a fan, you know. To me, it's like playing with McCartney or something. You know, sure. it's like that, that level. Because these are the guys that were really big at that, that seminal time in, in rock and roll. Yeah. And, you know, to me, it was the Spoonful, the Birds, the Beatles, Stones. You know, those, a particular group of, 
uh, of um, not only English but American bands at that time. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, that's that, I, I can understand that because when something is uh, like so deep seated within you, yeah, you know, it's not him. It's the he's evoking like a, an entire history of memories inside of you. You know, it's just a whole weird thing. So I totally get that. Yeah, I mean, he he just cracks up how I know these little parts that are on the record. Things that he forgot even existed. <laughs> like, I'm like, you know, when he does, um, when we do uh, Nashville Cats, you know, I said, well, don't you understand? Zally always played da 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 always at the beginning of every line. Nashville, da 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 He's like, you know, I never even thought of that. I'm like, really? This is from music. But it was so homogenized into the sound of the song. I like to conceive and conceptualize the whole sound that I heard when I heard that song. Not just, um, not just the song itself, but the sound of the record, the way all the parts fit together. Like if I'm doing House of the Rising Sun... I'll play the fills on the guitar that Alan Price played on the organ. Mm. You know what I mean? I'm the front and I'm on the back. I'm in the back as well. You know, I'm taking the lead and I'm also playing the fills of the other instruments. Um, Burt Bacharach mentioned that when I played on this Bacharach tribute album a couple of years ago, I did Wishing and Hoping, the Dusty Springfield song, and I got to record with her too, which was pretty amazing. Well. It, it was nothing that was ever released, unfortunately. But it was a great album. But even Bacharach said, you got the horn fills in there. You got his, her vocal nuances. And it's just one guitar. It's just one acoustic guitar. And I said, yeah. I said, that's how I hear the song. It's it's the full picture of it. It's the work of art yeah. that that record was. You know, so... Um, well, but he, years later, he's yeah. probably thinking, and John Sebastian's probably thinking, they're not in uh, production mode now, so they're thinking of they wrote this. They, they're thinking of the the writing, you know, the the creation right. of it, and you're thinking of the recreation of the whole of the of, right. of, of what of right. that imprint in your head. Right, and Sebastian, yeah. ironically enough, when he does a lot of his shows on his own, I didn't realize it, but he doesn't really play much spoonful stuff. See, this, this album is called Love in That Spoonful. Mm. So I'm actually, we're recreating the Spoonful stuff. But I always make sure to tip the hat to Zalianowski, because Zali played all those great parts, you know, such a terrific guitar player. And uh, that was very influential on me at that time. So all those licks matter, you know. And Sebastian just cracks up because he's hearing those blasts from the past. Sure, know? sure. You know, you talk about good guitar players. I always wanted to have on the show. Um, I don't remember the guy's name, but who who the guy who laid down the opening riff on Simon and Garfunkel's "The Boxer," and then I re found out he passed away. Oh so, yeah, that's. I remember I was with his. Um, yeah, I was in, in Nashville hanging out at a bar with his daughter. Yes, Penny, it's a doggy. Um, that's. Um, I can't think of his name, but no, I'll, I'll get it. Um, yeah, it's it's the same. It's a it's it's a Carter. Yes, a, yes, like Ray Carter. Fred, or Fred Carter. Yes, Fred Carter. yes, that was it. That's good, man. Ooh, that's now, dusted off your cobwebs. Holy shit, that's impressive. Well, well, Paul said that to me because we were listening to the stuff with him. Paul said, "That's Fred Carter. That's not me. That's Fred Carter." What an what an iconic. I mean, yeah. how do you not recognize that line? I mean, that's just, you know, yeah. fantastic. Well, we really, yeah. Well, we have that, we're doing that Mrs. Robinson on my new album, Me and Albert Lee. Mm. We did, da -da 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 -da, you know, all those great lit lit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's but that girl I was hanging out in the bar with, with me and Dwayne Eddy, when I was recording with Dwayne Eddy, uh, she said, well, that's my daddy that played that stuff with Simon and Garfunkel. And, uh, Fred Carter, she said, Fred Carter, that's the, her, she was um, uh, not Carlene Carter, but one of the other Carters. She's not from that Carter family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of Carters in Nashville. Uh, but anyway, but but uh, that was interesting, you know, 
because uh, yeah, you know, they, I mean, Paul plays good, you know, but they would have session guys do. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's clearly a session guy. I mean, that's you know, yeah. that's one of the that's one of those things where you know you see in a movie like uh, the session guys with the famous lines they lay down and you know. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, the Wrecking Crew. The, right, the Wrecking Crew. Uh, talk about Hot Licks. Uh, you and your wife started Hot Licks basically out of your living room. And at the time, that was, I, I would imagine, a revolutionary concept to even think of bringing sure. lessons to someone's house, you know. And, and that became obviously the pioneer to what became online lessons. What, what was the backstory to that whole business? Like, you know, how did that Very guess? simple. Very, very simple. I, I, in the early 70s, when I was giving a lot of private lessons uh, in New York City, I would encourage my students to always take their lessons because I, was, I wouldn't stop talking. I wouldn't stop teaching. There was so much that would go in one ear and out the other. I said, listen, bring a cassette player. And, and you know, bring a course, cassette player. That's so funny, that whole concept. <laughs> now, think of it. Because it started, I realized that Hot Lake started out with audio tapes first. Mm. We were audio from 1979 to 1984 or 5. 84. 84 was when I went into video. When I was shooting the movie Crossroads, that's when I went into video. Mm. So, um, so, yeah, we were doing... Uh, I taught, well, what happened was in 1979, Deborah and I, you know, I just finished the Phoebe Snow tour. There was the Art Garfunkel's tour in 78, <clears throat> then Phoebe in 79, and then I've been touring for like about nine years at that point. And the, um, uh, the, the phone wasn't ringing. There weren't any gigs happening. And we only had 2,000 bucks left. So back in 73, I made up my mind one day I was going to do something like that. So in 79, I said, look, I got $2,000. 1500 is going to be a half-page ad in Guitar Player. Well, I was already known. There already been articles on me in Guitar Player, album reviews. Um, and at that time, Guitar Player was pretty much the only game in town. And I had the um, $500 for a used tape recorder. And she said, oh, come on, you're crazy. What are you doing? And we weren't even married yet. We were just living together. You're crazy. She was teaching up in the South Bronx in such a bad neighborhood that I would take the subway with her in the morning and make sure she got to the school safely. <laughs> and then I would come back. Because she had just moved in with me from Boston. She was living in Boston. And so um, I said, look, I'm going to start this company, and I think I'm going to call it, uh, yeah, Hot Licks. <laughs> it took me all of like five seconds. It was actually a terrible name because then it spawned Star Licks, Pro Licks, This Licks, That Licks. Yeah, yeah. It was like all these people that were copying me. But it became such a phenomenon, you know, and I'd, I'd call her up. I'd be like, we got eight letters today. We got 12 letters today. We got 30 letters today. And I'm like, she was like, I'm giving up teaching. We've got a new business here, and she just shifted gears, and you know we had our loft in Lower Manhattan, uh, with no heat, hot water, or gas. We spent seven years in court fighting our landlord, and, um, and you're, you're, fulfilling, we, you're fulfilling all these orders out of your apartment, like you got the cassettes and out of the loft. Yeah, we would get the cassettes. In fact, they were still white and blank. Oh. We didn't even have labels, and I'd have to go to the post office and wait online. I'd go out with my little red push cart with all my uh, this was at the World Trade Center right we lived two blocks from the World Trade Center I'd go to the post office God, that, that line for the post office must have been an hour and a half yeah I went out and the guy goes oh this one's going to California that's zone 8 I'm like, all right yeah. then I find out later talk about having to learn everything I find out we could get our own postage machine yeah, yeah. Oh, Pitney Bowes a Pitney Bowes machine and so then was I'm getting stamps and I'm buying postage and and we we got a high speed duplicator that could do these tapes mm. fast. So we're cranking them out, you know. And of course, when it came to audio tapes, Happy Traum, my good buddy, yeah. was already doing homespun mm. tapes, you know. But then we became the first ones to do video. And that was nineteen eighty four. I'd shot like six of my own and one with John Entwistle, you know, on bass. 
How'd you get a hold of John? How did you hook up with John? My, I had a really nice distributor in England, in Northern England, called Stephen McLucky. What a name! It's, yeah, I know, I know quite a name. And he's like, oh, and you know, I could get this one for you and that one for you. Like he was, it was easier to get in touch with people within England. You know, yeah. by another English guy, like they, they would, they were, he knew the, the ropes of how to get them. The next thing you know, I'm talking to John Entwistle, and Entwistle for, did some audio tapes for me first in his own studio, and they're brilliantly done. I had like a lot of people were assigning, like Steve Morse and people like that were doing audio tapes for me. Mm. You know? And then Entwistle said, sure, I'd love to do, love to do a, a video. You so, know, so he flew over? He flew over it, and he made sure that it was the airline where they give you the entire bottle of wine. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, John. He said, I'll go first class, but they'll give you the full bottle of wine. You got it, John. And he was the best, you know. And and then he found out we had a an oriental masseuse there to, like, limber people up. For, he goes, screw the video. Let's get the massage. The know? massage. The massage. So... He did such a great. It, it, he was so wonderful. I performed with him a couple of times too at the Nam shows. What so. an amazing, amazing, oh, the best, the best. It's just you know he talk about a guy who created a revolution in in bass. Oh yeah, well see he thought the reason he took up bass because he said I thought that's what Dwayne Eddy was playing. <laughs> so that's why he got that big twangy, stringy sound, you know, but. And Twistle was the best. And what a great guy. I was at his house in London, you know, where all the statues of Marilyn Monroe everywhere, and the gigantic Irish wolfhound, Boris the spider. He's got spiders all over the place. I mean, just, you know, a great guy. Just And, and fun, and a very dry sense of humor, you know. And um, I saw he would tell me Keith Moon stories, you know. It was crazy. Oh, wow. That's right. Yeah. I, I saw a documentary one time, and he has like hundreds of basses, doesn't he? And guitars. He had a great collection of guitars, too. Mm. I was so deeply saddened when we lost him because oh, yeah. he was uh, um, just a pleasure, you know. And, um, you know, it, it, it's all these guys. I mean, like I played in, in Europe, played in uh, Germany with Jack Bruce, oh. which was a whole other story. That was like. You know, they, it was scary. You know, Jack Bruce had quite a reputation, and he, he lived up to it for sure. On that a reputation in what way? Being obnoxious, violent, or? really violent, mean, violent, obnoxious, drunk. Wow! And it's another shame. guy, an amazing, amazing talent. Oh yeah, he took. Well, he got his whole huge Hot Wigs video uh, uh, advance from me, and then he never did his tape. Well, if I do it one day, if I do it. You know, we got really snide about it. John Entwistle said, he said, J I was talking about how far away Jack lived, like in northern Scotland. Mm. He goes, well, Jack doesn't see many people because the ones he does, he hits. He hits them. So, and it was I mean, I, 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 you know, I was, we had been talking, Jack and I had been talking over the phone about doing a hot licks thing. And then I said, look, I'm coming over to Germany to do this owner filter show live show it, it i had it on youtube for a while but then it got removed but jack put together a little you know he got a drummer this guy mark nasif who had been playing with phil and linnet yeah from phil Finn Lizzie. From, yeah and so uh me jack and him played you know go to do this tv show and it was just so hard dealing with him fighting really? him. Oh God! Huey Lewis had to come in the room and like, like, like stop the fight, you know. And then the producer of the show said, "Mitch Jack, this always happens. Mitch Jack, you could just go on without him. I've had it. I've had it because there's always a fight, you know." He's telling me, "Oh, I've got to have all the money. Nobody else gets paid." Telling me, "I can't get paid." Telling me, "This is Jack saying." I said, "Jack, we worked out this deal from New York." I told you it's a three-man band. We're getting paid three thousand dollars. We're going to get a thousand dollars a piece. He wasn't even going to let his drummer get paid. Was, was he like a 
I don't, I don't know if it's appropriate to even ask, is he in like an active addict or something? Because that sounds like drug behavior. Uh, alcohol. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's addict behavior. Albert Lee, yeah. Albert Lee told me, he said, don't, don't let him drink. So, you know, he showed up already blasted, you know. I mean, it was two days before he even uttered a word to me. He uttered a word, nothing. He just kept on his sunglasses and... <laughs> One day I said to him, so he starts playing this song of mine called Restless Age, which went, you know, it's the E, A, B, D, just a couple of chords. And he's just playing E, e open E, and smoking a cigarette, you know, being deliberately defiant. I guess defiant is one of the good words for him. And I said, oh, geez, now how do I break the ice here? What do I say to this guy? He hasn't talked to me yet for two days. I said, Jack, you know when this song it goes to E, I had sent you a tape, then it goes to A. Go, oh, get a fucking bloody studio musician, I can't play this shit anyway. And he takes his bass, a Warwick bass, or Warwick as they pronounce it, and threw it 40 feet across the, 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 the um, TV studio. Blam! It just crashes into a wall. And I'm there like, all right, this is great. This is my introduction to having to do this stupid gig in Germany, where I didn't even want to be, you know, but it was a television show. It was like with Yui Lewis, who I ended up touring with later. You know, me and Yui became good friends, and Yui's a great guy. You know, I was with Dwayne Eddy, and we were opening their tour, Yui Lewis and the News. And, um, but Jack was like, of course, once the lights hit and it's time for the television show, Oh, it's friendly. Hey, Jack, hey, you know. Yeah, that's sudden, addict behavior, man. Unfortunately. You know what he's like? He's like that Scottish character that um, Mike Myers. Used Fat to do. bastard? No, no, no. He had the. Um, he says, Welcome to all things Scottish, where if it's not Scottish, it's crap. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And like we have the dual personality. Yeah, yeah. That's the way Jack was. But, you know, you got to wonder how the hell cream ever functioned because, you know, you have. Uh, uh, Ginger Baker, who's you know at least well, in looking at the movie, was pretty volatile. You want you he did know a video for me. He did a video for this. Hi, this is Ginger Baker. Ginger Baker. Yeah, but and Jack. Well, but but if you watch me on these tapes, you see I start cracking up because we're a three man band. So the minute I go into a solo, right away it turns into Queen because he starts playing way up the neck on the bass, like and he's playing fretless. Completely out of tune, but it was like it's Jack Bruce, you know. And Jack Bruce is really a terrific musician. Oh yeah, yeah, really good musician. Yeah. So I wasn't exactly getting the best of Jack Bruce. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah, Cream. Yeah, it's it's kind of like this this intimidation thing that kind of kept them going, or maybe it ended up being the end of them. But yeah, Jack Bruce and Ginger Baker used to fight a lot. Of God. Talk about hey, who cares? I yeah. couldn't stand that band anyway. I ha- I hated that music, so muddy, so distorted and flubby. I couldn't stand the sound of that group. Cream? I, yeah, I hated them. Really I, interesting. I hated them. I at that time I would rather listen to the Birds, the Spoonful, you know, uh, something cleaner, something a little bit less right. thuddy. I couldn't stand that guitar tone, you know. I mean, I liked, I, I, I preferred the Jimi Hendrix experience. Right. Way over cream. It's funny. That's what I think Clapton had his best tone. <laughs> that's his best tone, but I, I love it wasn't it. tough. Yeah, and, yeah. Well, no, it's, you know, different strokes, it's like ice my, cream flavors. Yeah. yeah not, my, not my taste. Totally. I get it. But I appreciate what Clapton has done, no doubt about yeah. it. Yeah. You know. Um, okay, so, and so... You start doing the videos, and does the business all of a sudden explode even greater once the videos come out? Yeah. Oh, the videos, yeah, forget it. The videos. I mean, that $2,000, first of all, with the audio tapes that I put in, um, $2,000, it took in $18,000 the very first month. Wow. So I knew we were real, and back then that was a lot of money. Well, yeah, nine to one on that, on your ad spend, or ten yeah, to and we were whatever. paying yeah. three hundred fifty a month for rent, you know, and we could barely make that happen. Yeah. You know, so, um, but yeah. Um, so how did that change? How did that business wind up changing your life? 
Well, it made me able to support my family and not have to be on the road all the time. I channeled my energy, which is very competitive and very um, driving. I channeled that energy that I used to get gigs all of a sudden into being able to get artists who were my peers, who respected me. Yeah. They wouldn't listen to somebody else, but like, oh, Arlen, you want me? Like Steve Morse loved my playing. He wants like sure I'll, I'll argue. how did you play that solo how did you you know so like it was a great honor I'm getting like respect from my fellow guys you know and uh, like John John Jarvis who played piano with me with, with Art Garfunkel he did an audio series for me but once I went into video it took it was hard to convince people like Mick Taylor or Lonnie Mack or some of these other people who weren't exactly adept at explaining, I said, don't worry. I said, the video explains it for you. Mm. The video, we got three cameras going. You know, I had James Burton, people like that. James Burton was so scared, he didn't know what to, what to say. So what I did was I asked him questions, and then I would take my questions out. In the earlier videos, like me and Entwistle, you know, I'm jamming and playing with him. Okay. And then you're bantering back and forth, so you're yeah. the A and he's the B, and then he's providing the answers. And then right. in the later videos, you ask the questions, but you, God, editing on that must have been a freaking nightmare. Eh, it depends on the artist, hmm. you know. Depends on the artist. Uh, some some guys just they just needed that little tap on the shoulder of of encouragement. The next thing you know, they're off and running. Okay, yeah. You know? They were from so like you know, really no problem at all for some of them. Like uh, Vinnie Moore, or uh, uh, I remember Vinnie Moore. He was waiting while there was a guy before him. It was taking eight hours to do his video. We used to do it at a Chinese television station in Chinatown. Oh my god! And they would only come in to do the news like a half hour every day. Then the rest of the time we had the full studio. So Vinnie's waiting and waiting, and so he had to make a train. So he had only one hour to do a one-hour video, and he wow. just did it. Well, same thing with me. I'd be like, we have an hour left. I think I'll do one about rhythm and blues. Yeah, you yeah. know, flying by the seat of up course, you never know when you'd have one of these guys that would take eight hours. You know, so um, but it was it was great. Generally speaking, I would do two or three different artists or videos in a day. Yeah, and uh, you know. We were averaging, I guess we were probably doing about 20, 20 to 30 new videos every year. Wow, that's incredible. That's a lot of new yeah. product. Oh, oh yeah. Uh, how, how many in the catalog in total at its peak? It reached, I think I did 220 videos by 180 artists. Wow, and you sold this all by direct mail. Not only uh, by direct I mean, so mail, it started, ads. It started, yeah, started by direct mail ads, and then we started getting distributors. Okay. You know, we had like, music sales distributing us. In fact, I toured all over the world thanks to my distributors. I toured Europe doing my like, clinics. I toured Australia, you know, Japan, uh, uh, doing, like, doing hot licks clinics everywhere. And uh, like in Japan, we had Yamaha. In Europe, we had Stephen McLucky. <laughs> so, and, and, yeah. So a distributor would bring you in. You'd post a clinic. Yeah, so a distributor would bring you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So then it would be, it, it would, it was a self-perpetuating machine. You generate. It would be lead generation for the hot licks, and then they'd see you in person to be more sales. And then, okay. Oh God, yeah. When I did Australia, it was like the biggest thing going on in Australia. I had thirty-five hundred people at one clinic in uh, Sydney. Holy crap. Melbourne, I had 1,500. I mean, the giant screen above me, of course, they really knew how to do the tour right. Mm. I mean, they made it like a rock tour. And I'm just up there playing songs and giving breaks and telling funny stories and drinking beer, you know. And then next thing I know, when I came out with Tooling Around, it became a huge hit in uh, Australia. I said, that's because I already toured to promote it. I basically... Because I was there, everybody was like, Arlen Roth, Arlen Roth, you know. And they were all telling me, you ever hear of a guy named Tommy Emmanuel? I'm like, no. He said, well, we, you remind him of, of, remind us of him, you know. Um, 
Then, of course, I found out later that Tommy was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, but uh, touring Australia, that was great. But eight, like six to eight weeks of non-stop, a different city every day, television, radio, da, 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 da. one hour to eat, and then boom, the, the concert, you know. Yeah, but what a great opportunity to get all these customers without spending ad dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, your customer acquisition cost was being paid for. That's true. And also you're getting, just like a big ad in a magazine does, it's a show of strength. Yeah. You know, we would take out a double-page spread sometimes a guitar player. It was no longer about getting coupons. It was about, well, of course, we had the 800 number, but... It was just about a show of strength. Yeah. I remember taking out a double page ad where I said, Hot League's video, you just have to know us by our first name. You know, it would be like Tuck, Arlen, Scotty, you know, Chuck, whatever, you know, you know, everybody just first name. And we were really, you know, really cooking with gas. It was a it was a big thing and I because we were doing so well, I was the first one also to really offer real good advances to these artists. Like some of these guys, they wouldn't listen to you unless you mentioned big money. Yeah. You know, like Buddy Guy, I had to offer him big money. You know, Eric Johnson, big money because he his first video already did so well. Right. You know? So I blew a lot of my competition out of the water with that because we were just showing strength that we weren't being cheap mm. you know so we were um i loved it i loved it. it's like a, a very big segment of my life and a lot of passion doing those videos like we would do shoot some in chicago you know and get to feel, they start to become a little bit more documentary like mm. you know we'd have like um we'd go to the south side of chicago and shoot the wind blowing and the kids playing basketball and Meanwhile, buddy guys playing a riff, you know. So we would make it a little bit more movie-like, which I, I love. I love that. Wow. And what what ultimately happened with the business? Or where did it go? I, I think you sold it? No. Well, what happened with the business was because uh, when I lost my wife and daughter, I no longer could function. Yeah, I'm sure. You can't you can't deal with a, with a, with a disaster like that. So I... Um, I tried to keep it going. I had people working for me, but there was one woman in particular who was there who was, ended up stealing all the money that was coming in that I never knew was happening. Everybody thought she was going to be the greatest thing in sliced bread. And, you know, I would get like $20,000 and she'd take $110,000 without, without me even knowing it. And she would just let all the orders pile up. She would never, never fulfill the orders. So she sent the business down so far that I spent seven years just trying to sell it. She wouldn't pay the artists any royalties. Oh, crap. All this behind my back and not knowing. And then she'd come to me at, at the end of every workday and tell me that everybody else was robbing me. Well, when she finally got everybody else away from the business, because we had five people working for us, um, and I saw people screaming at her when I would do like a trade show. Uh, then I started knowing something was fishy, you know. She was writing all the checks to herself. You know, she oh, made me stop her. She said, you know, you don't need this, um, these accountants. You don't need this. You don't need that. Okay. Whatever you say, whatever you say. And, um, yeah, no, she sent the business down crashing. She ruined, she destroyed Hot Lake. She destroyed my life even more than it was destroyed at that mm -hmm. point. And uh, like I said, seven years trying to sell it. But when it was sold, it went it went to music sales and it only went to music sales for the debt that was owed. Yeah. So I didn't make a penny. So you just got out from under the obligation. Right. And what happened was I, they kept me on for like a three year period <coughs> as a consultant. Mm. And I got sort of like a nominal. Yeah you know, thing for that. And then that was it. But they never listened to my consulting. <laughs> Did she wind up going to jail or? No, no. Uh, that was, um, I don't really want to get into that. No, that's thing. cool. Totally cool, man. I'm just so sorry I had to deal with this. Let yeah, me... it's terrible. It's, you know, unbelievable what human beings will do. 
Let me ask this. you. You mentioned that you lost your wife and daughter. That was in '98. Um, if you're comfortable talking, how do you even begin to like process like that and start healing? From I mean, I, I, I there's no there. The only thing that helped me, the only process was that I had my ten year old daughter Lexi at that point to raise. And she had to go through the same thing that I did. Mm. She lost them too. And so it was she and I. And after that, um, there was a very dear woman who the kids always knew and who Deborah knew. Deborah was my late wife. And uh, everybody knew who uh, was actually the godmother. So she was from Sweden. And I didn't even think about that. One day my mother said to me, why don't you call up Annie already? Because I kept thinking, okay, now it's going to be a never-ending life of just, you know, nannies and au pairs or whatever, or somebody to help me take care of Lexi, who was still a little girl, you know. And, um, you know, a lot of the community really came around and helped support us for a few months anyway. You know, like every night a new meal came from somebody else, another stranger bought a meal. And there were many, uh, you know, Jillian, you have to understand, Jillian was the kid. She was going to be a huge star. She had her own television show as a guitar player already at the age of 14. She had signed on to do 27 episodes. We were going to move to Florida to be there for her career because she was going to, she was signed to uh, um, Nickelodeon. And then two days after she recorded the theme for the song, for the show, she that was when the accident happened. So, um, you know, you can never, ever, you can't accept it. it. To this day, it's 20 years, and to this day it feels like yesterday, you know. And um, so, you know, I ended up uh, living with that, with Annie, that became a relationship as well. And she helped me, you know, help raise Lexi to a certain degree for like about a five year period. And then, uh, you know, we just, you know, just trying to survive, you know, and it's, it's still, to this day, it's the same thing. It's still the same act of survival continuum. Lexi doing it through her music, through how hard she works, you know, she's an actress. She's in a lot of movies now, just like Jillian was an actress. Jillian was going to be the biggest thing. They knew it. Her agents knew that she was just going to be it, you know. And I always said, like, if she found a role uh, for television where, because yeah, really, she was doing the acting thing starting at about 10 or 11. She and I were going around the country. She'd be doing commercials. Um, uh, but, you know, she was being pushed too hard. She was being pushed too hard. She was a number one student in New York State, and at the same time, having to do auditions and gigs in New York City practically every day. And that's when the accident occurred, when they were coming back from a New York uh, audition, where if she had gotten it, it would have meant like a hundred bucks. You know what I mean? She already had her television show. I said, why are you idiots pushing her more? And, um, you know, it's just, it's, it's beyond anything that you could ever really comprehend. Yeah. The feeling of what it is to have somebody be the entire universe that, you know, is wrapped around her and then it's gone. And, of course, she's not gone because she still always gives us signals all the time and things that she does. I mean, very, very obvious things. And... Um, you know, like I was with Lexi a couple of weeks ago and we were up all night talking about what happened with the accident because she was a very little girl and, and she really wants to know the details of things. So the more I got into details, we're talking and talking and talking. And then there was a key in the door uh, in that room. And when I got up after telling the stories and talking about it all, the key was completely bent 
180 degrees while still in the lock bent to face the wall. Like, like I couldn't even physically bend that key, mm -hmm. but it was bent. That was the key we had just put in that door. So we're telling that story, and that was Jillian that bent that key to tell us that she was there listening, you know. And, um, you know, I would hear her walking up and down the stairs in our old house where, we, where she grew up. Um, because everything, this wasn't supposed to happen, you know. This wasn't supposed to happen. She was the greatest kid in the entire world. And um, so, you know, it's just, it's, um, for me, it's way beyond something I can even cry about anymore. Because if I were to begin to cry, I'd cry for a thousand years, you know. So yeah. that's the feeling that you have to understand that wraps around it. But the fact that I have my daughter and she's doing so well, really, <laughs> All I really ask for is that she be safe. Yeah, of course. That she be well. That's all I want. Well, so I know that one day they leave and they don't come back. Right. You know? and, and with her mother, too. You know? So it's like I couldn't even grieve with her mom. With You know, this I just had to be... I remember somebody said to me, it's not a whole new chapter. It's a whole new book. I said, yeah, you better believe it. It's a whole new book. It's a whole... You wake up every day as if you died and then you have to be like, oh i'm still alive i'm going to go on i'm going to try to go on and that's exactly what it's like you know uh, the strength of our family and our family unit and what it was because there was so much love that's why it's carried on well with me and, and my daughter and the fact that she been a, i always said that she at least had her years on her side you know i was 45 she was 10 when it happened, you know. So it it destroyed me in the middle of, it's our peak, you know, peak of life for all of us, struck down. So I try to do whatever I can just with music and, uh, you know, losing the business. That was all part of it, you know, it was just. How could that not happen? How yeah. could that not happen? No, you know? just, it, and of course, we had evil people that were stealing and doing stuff, making it happen even worse. People taking advantage of a tragedy, which I can't even fathom. No, it's it's not normal. Like Man, I'm um, I don't even know what to say. Outside. I'm just so sorry that you had to deal with that. I cannot begin to imagine. I don't think anybody realistically can begin to imagine that you know it's, just, it's so terrible that it had to happen i mean it's never good anytime but the fact that it had to happen at such a peak when everything we all our love was wrapped around jillian and her success she got her own television show she was so creative and so loved by everybody i mean she went to this big school where if a new family came it was her job to introduce them to the school because she was the representative. She was the one that everybody loved. She was the champion softball player. You know, she was, all these awards are named for her and all these things. You know, she was, uh, she's a giant legend. You know, there's that wonderful video of that Danny Gatton tribute at Tramps on, on, on YouTube where she and I are performing. She's playing the telly with me. She was only 11. You know, and she's there playing Susie Q with James Burton in the front row, watching her play Susie Q that, that he played when he was 15, you know. So we had so many amazing times together. She was my best buddy. She was everything. You know, we we would just go anywhere. So come on, let's go fishing. Oh, mommy's away? Come on, we'll spend the weekend going fishing. You know, to me, again, being brought up by the kind of father I had, an opportunity to be with my kids was the greatest thing ever. Right. You know, to just have my children with me. Why do you think I had hot licks? So I could be home and have my family watch my children grow up. Right. Not be on the road and, and like, oh, gee, I wish I had been around for my kids. No, I was around for them. Right. I was with them all the time. And if I had only been driving that day, you know, then this wouldn't have happened. So that's, that's what it amounts to.
you know, and uh, there was all kinds of controversy. The town of Greenwich, Connecticut, totally screwed up everything. They didn't have the life-saving equipment around when the accident happened. Um, there was a rift between two factions of the uh, firemen in that town, the union versus the volunteer, and they had the, all the stuff that they needed to save them was like five towns away. So, no, it's, it's the perfect storm of everything coming together as a complete nightmare. Like my mom would say, the worst, it had to be the worst thing ever to happen, and that's what happened. You know, so. Is, I, I don't want First of all, thank you for, you know, talking about that. And, and um, Well, I, there were 2,000 people at the funeral, and I got up and I talked, you know. I said, there's a lot of people here who probably didn't know them personally, but were coming here out of uh, respect. I said, I'm not going to let a crowd like this just listen to a rabbi I've never known and a priest I've never known, you know, because Deborah was Catholic, was Italian. I said, you know, I said, I'm going to get up there and I'm going to, I practically had to be held up, but I talked and I told stories and I told of the love. Plus, you know, you're still in the present. You're still on autopilot. Yeah, that right. That's the, the part that's so hard to yeah. imagine. Yeah, it's, you know, and I don't know. I think maybe I'm on autopilot still, you know. I think I'm still on some kind of floating thing, you know, that it, that is enabling me to, um, I don't know. I was in almost in a very bad car accident last summer. And most people who saw it said there was no way I could have survived that accident. And nothing even touched me. My car just suddenly moved off the road. And maybe they moved it off. Of me. Right. I don't know. But I mean, everybody says to me, what are you doing here? You, this, there, there was a lunatic driving down the middle of the road, this tiny little country road. And he was uh, in an, on a suicide mission kill himself. And then when I came back later, I saw that he went right through two stone walls, old stone walls from the 1700s. He knocked through them. Yeah. And he missed me by like a half an inch. You know, I was driving a 56 Buick convertible, delivering it to somebody who was buying it. We were going to ship it to California. I said, all right, this is the last drive of this car. I better be careful. All of a sudden, this guy can go to nowhere. But I mean, you know, it's it's uh, it's a wake up call. Of course, like I didn't mean, need wake up calls, but like not that not life. that much of a wake up. No, you don't need it, and nobody deserves it. And there's none of this crap about. Oh, now you really appreciate life? No way. I appreciate the life that was before. That's the life I appreciate. The life that I had built so hard to have a happy life for my child and my family, my children and my wife. That's the, that's the life I want back. Everything else after that is just an imitation of it. It really is. What would you advise somebody listening to this who's gone through something similar? Oh, gee, I don't know. I mean, because it's kind of, everybody's situation is similar but different. Sure. Um, I think that you have to be aware that something like this could happen and that when you plan things, think of it, don't, don't ever take anything for granted. That's all. Just don't take anything for granted. Um, but when you go through the shock, it's how you deal with the trauma and shock that is the most uh, important thing. Because people always say to me, oh, I don't know how you did it. I would never have made it through that. I would never have lived through that. I said, well, you don't know that. I said, you don't know. You would probably be, you'd have to do it just like I did. You know, you, you have to persevere. Luckily for me, I remember one time talking to Deborah about it. I said, well, what would happen if something ever happened, you know, to, to one of our children? She said, you'd, ha you'd go on for the other one. You'd have to go on for the other one. And that, of course, is what I did. Um, so, 
and the joy of seeing her flourish and how creative she is and how much she's been able to overcome that adversity. That to me is the purpose right there. You know, when we play together, but sometimes we perform together where there's such a, a closeness that we don't realize it, but the audience, we have to beg the audience to stop cheering because they're overcome with, with emotion, with something that they're seeing that we're just feeling naturally, you know? Right. And we're like, please, we have more songs to do. Please stop. And they're like over the top cheering, you know, like we're out of love. So it's pretty incredible, you know, what Lexi and I have. And I play with her as much as I can. She's very busy as an actress now, as a chef. You know, she's being a private chef for somebody this summer. And her music, you know, she's got all these fantastic music videos out on YouTube. Lexi Roth, you know, the great, great stuff. Very, she just won a some kind of award for one of them. It's like a, a woman's video award, like like it's an all world kind of um, award that she won for this one video. How old is she? Yeah. She's now thirty one. Um, man, thank you again. And I'm, I'm yeah, so my, no, look, I, look, I mean, my story is it's. It's not a story unless it's told. You know? Yeah, I know, and and I, uh, man, I'm sorry. It's That's... crazy. I know it's crazy. It's it's, uh, you know, but it's been 20 years, and like I said, it it feels like it's been only one day, but I guess the 20 years have given me a chance to see her grow up. Right. You know? And it's been pretty obvious that her sister is watching this too. I mean, we know that. We know for a fact. We get, yeah. We're getting signs all the time from her. So, um, and probably her mom as well, you know? And so, you know, it's just, um, my dad knew that he had a certain Zen approach to life that no matter what happens, it happens. That's it. There's no turning back. There's no, you know, anything. And, uh, of course, he comes from, you know, Europe, where they were, you know, thrown out yeah. and persecuted, and, uh, you know, his, his his father's his father we called him the chief. The chief came here from Romania, and then you know, then they lived in Austria. He came here, set up shop for family <clears throat> in 1922, and then they all came over. And my dad was 11, but you know, the rest of my the chief's family were all killed in the Holocaust. Right. You know, they just came in and took everybody. You know, and uh, and they were also driven out by the Russians too. You know, my, I mean, everything from both sides. You know, everybody was being persecuted. So uh, the stories he would tell were just unbelievable. You know? Well, your dad was wired for survival from a young exactly. age so it's a different right. mindset his expectations and uh coping skills and and frame of reference is different okay so this is probably a tough question you've been involved in so many so many cool projects is there a possible way that you could like what were the top three projects you'd evolve with to yourself either like musically or which ones left you feeling most satisfied, most rewarding? Yeah, I well, yeah, that's, that's a tough one because there have been so many. Yeah, I mean, and obviously, the whole scope of what I did with Hot Lakes was very rewarding, and you know, it ended very sadly, unfortunately, because of you know what happened. Sure, but um, but I mean, I you know, it's hard to say because at different stages of your life, you know, like. Crossroads, doing Crossroads, that was an amazing thing. Because while we were doing it, it was so long and so intense and so 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 much fun. You know, I mean like to be in Mississippi shooting for seven weeks on a, on a set, well, not on a set, uh, in Mississippi. That was the set. Um, you know, outdoors, all these locations, nighttime, daytime, going out and getting barbecue, go, going out and jamming with everybody and then all that stuff would end up in the film because a lot of the stuff that I did uh, when I was in Mississippi, just like sinking my teeth into the place, 
that ended up in the film. Like Ralph would come, he said, man, I just saw Arlen go into this club where there's never been a white guy playing, and they gave me a hard time, you know, uh, even though it was, it was an amazing thing. Ralph says, I want that to be in the movie. So then that ended up in the film, you know, uh, like they wrote it into the film right then and there. And, you know, there's that scene where he comes across the tracks and mm. tries to be a, a white kid in this all-black club, you know, and that kind of stuff. And so it was really exciting. You know, so I was – me and Juke Logan, John Juke Logan, the late great, was the, he was a harmonica guy for the film. I was the guitar guy. He was a harmonica guy. So he and I were just, like, tearing it up all throughout Mississippi and just having such a great time because they didn't meet us every day. Sure. You know, we'd be like, it's your turn to ask the director. And I go, but Walter, are you going to be doing any music today? No, you guys can go. You don't, oh, yay. We, don't have to work. <laughs> and we just head off in and we get a 1973 big bomb Chrysler and just head off into the sunset, you know, get it from Ugly Duckling Rent-A-Car. And we just head off into the sunset and, and just, you know, just have a blast and find guitars and find and meet people. I mean, you know, just amazing things that, that it was like a lifetime of experiences within within just that period. And of course, the whole period of working on the movie was seven months. So that's definitely one of the most rewarding. I would say the people, most. Pe yeah, go ahead. People were friendly in Mississippi. What? I, were the, was was the people friendly? I have never been there. Yeah, the 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 black folks were really friendly. The white people were a little bit weird. You're going to Jew me down? Are you going to Jew me? Everything. I said, what are you talking about, Jew you down? I don't even know that expression. It's like a regular part of like the, the colloquial language. Like, oh you know, God. hi, ugly duckling ran a car. Are you going to Jew me down? Well, uh, I don't know. You're going to Christian me down. I mean, what are you talking about? Oh, my so, God. So, so the, the, but I mean, you know, but then you'd run into like a little elderly black woman who's like 90 or something and lives on a plot of land that's like, you know, 30 by 30 feet. And she'll take you into her home and say, look at the flowers I'm doing. Look at the beautiful things. and Please come in. Let me make you something to eat, you know, like, but people very friendly and very um, just real down home, you know, like. It's it's a place where it's everything is so slowed down. Yeah, it's not like anywhere else in this country, probably except in a few pockets. But Mississippi's like it's almost like you've gone to a different country. Is the way it felt to me, <clears throat> and I loved it. I loved being down there. So go ahead. I'm sorry. So you said Crossroads is one of those experiences. Crossroads is definitely one of those experiences, like on a whole. You know? Yeah. And the fact that I was able to create things on the spot and have them become part of the film like that. And of course, Ralph, Ralph's job as an actor was not only to study the guitar with me, but was to study me. Okay. You know, he emulate the way I walked when I held a case, the way I acted, the way, you know. So every time, so he would go everywhere when I was doing anything because he wanted to really, you know, um, in a way, I was sort of like mentoring him. Yeah, being a guitar type guy, you mm -hmm. know what I mean. So he took it really seriously as an actor, and I've got to hand it to him. He every detail, not only of guitar playing, but detail of me, how I carried myself, or the things I said, or whatever. He wanted to absorb that. That's you know? pretty cool. And I took him to like concerts. I took him to see Segovia, and we're like. Segovia at this point was already like schlumping in his chair. He's like about 94. Ralph goes, what's with it? I said, Ralph, don't pay attention to his position. <laughs> this is Segovia not at his peak right now. <laughs> so, so we went to see him like at uh, Lincoln Center or something. You know. How old was but, Ralph at the time? Probably in his early 20s? Um, I guess, um, well, if I, I was about 31, 31 or 32, um, so Ralph was like, I think 25. Yeah. Only about a six year difference between us. Mm. So, you know, that was great. I, I would say one of the most rewarding tours was playing with, believe it or not, just playing with Art Garfunkel. 
that tour was so professionally handled and had such class and we had a small group you know but but a top-notch group and the band became like family you know it was like uh Artie and then we had Leah Kunkel on vocals as well who was Mama Cass Elliot's sister oh wow and um she was great to work with and the great John Jarvis on piano who had just come off of a uh, Rod Stewart tour so he was like, you know, Mr. Rock and Roll kind of thing. But he and I are just watching, like, we're, we're worrying about health food and eating right. And our idea of entertainment was watching Julia Childs on the <laughs> on television. Hello. I'm like, I'm like, what are you doing? Like, oh, oh, we, you, know, you put the strawberries on the fat little bottoms and then <laughs> clarified butter. And he's like, we pull, in, we, we pull into, like, Philadelphia. We get in a hotel and John would be like, Channel 11. And I turn on, and there would be Julia Childs. You know, she was like, we weren't such wild rock and rollers. We're worried about the vitamins we're taking, and taking, you know, apple cider vinegar, and uh, and all that. But then at one time, he decided to throw a watermelon out the window. I think just because he missed doing that. <laughs> but we were so we were all, you know. And it, but the wildest person on tour was we had this this Korean cellist girl. From the Philharmonic, named Chung Young Lee. She, forget it. Don't take a classical musician who's been under stiff, you know, regimen on a rock and roll tour. Forget it. It's all over. They go crazy. Yeah. Huh? You finally have no pressure. You know, you get these phone calls like, "I need you now. I need you now." <laughs> and I'd be like, "Is she there? Is she there?" Oh, I will call. Like she'd call me. She'd call John. She'd call. Every male member of the band going so we had for years. We, if me and John called each other. We'd be like, "I need you now." That was like our, our that was our little code. Tip. That was our code. Yeah. But he was wild. In fact, she had to like be taken off the tour for many reasons. Oh, she's that out of control. And that out of control. And then, don't you realize we make love every night when we're on stage? And then she attacks the piano player. At this thing at the tavern on the green, and then like ten billion shrimp. <laughs> or we were actually ankle deep in shrimp at this party, <laughs> and she like she got oh that was also the day that Garfunkel stepped on her cello and cracked it in half. Oh. A sixteen thirty like Guarneri cello stepped on it at Carnegie Hall. Like oh, great, this poor thing survived. Since 1630 or whatever it was, yeah, and that's it. So it was kind of a wild day to begin with. But then she wouldn't come out of her apartment the next day. We had to play up in Poughkeepsie. She wouldn't come out of her apartment. Anymore. So then Artie, Artie did a very generous thing. He took her salary. He didn't find another cello player. He took her salary and gave all of us raises. Wow, that's really cool. Which then that was when we realized she was making a hell of a lot more money than we were. <laughs> because my raise was almost equal to like what I was making. Oh wow! So it almost doubled my. So so yeah, but the Garfunkel tour was great because it was first class all the way. We played wonderful, you know, venues, and um, I was of course teacher's pet because I'm there playing the Paul Simon parts, you know, like uh, really well. Artie really loved it, and uh, we became like family. You know, we had this uh, this drummer, Hammer and Harold Alexander, and Artie insisted on having drums but no bass. So every time he would hit a backbeat, Artie would go, "No, Harold, no." He's like, "Oh, the stars out tonight." No, don't do that. It's like, but Art, he's playing the backbeat. There's no bass player for him to work with. Right. So every time he did anything, it sounded wrong. How come there's wrong. no bass player? He said, I don't like bass. I, I said, all right, you That's need bass. Yeah. So the rest of us all spent the entire tour playing a lot of low notes. You know? mm. <laughs> Hello, darkness, my old. Dun, 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 dun. And, and the cello, also low. Blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, that was weird. you know. But a lot of his songs, of course, were just me and him. Like we would just walk out on stage together. you know. Uh, and then after I got hit by the car on that tour, I had to be waiting on stage for him. 
was I got hit. I one day off in New York City, hit and run accident. A person hit me on Chambers Street, right on my knee, sent me flying about 20 feet and uh, into a crowd of people and into banks of snow because it was winter. And uh, then I had to do the rest of the tour. I had to do 40 cities uh, unable to walk. Wow. Did, what, so that was, what the hell were you doing on Chambers Street? There's nothing there back I lived in the day. Oh, okay. I had a walk. Okay. I had a walk on Warren Street, right okay. around the corner, right by the World Trade Center. Yeah. And me and my girlfriend at the time, we had gotten in a fight. And so I walked outside and I decided I'm going to do whatever. And then I'm standing, I was still on the sidewalk and this woman was going the wrong way on the, in the street. She was going the wrong way and she hit me right on the knee and then came back to make sure I was okay. And then she gave me a fake name, fake address, and the police told me, there's no such person as what wow. she said. That's so a lot of drama. Technically a hit and run. Yeah. So then after that, I had, you know, I would come out on the stage with a walker or I'd be with a wheelchair. And uh, one not one time they, uh, they forgot to tell me to go on stage because they would have to bring me. Yeah. That was four flights up in Rochester. All of a sudden I hear applause <sighs> on the monitors. I'm like, I'm sitting there in the dressing room drinking like a, a, a scotch or something. And then they're like, where were you? I'm like, I'm in my dressing room. Where do you think I am? They actually had to carry me down four flights of stairs because there was no elevator. And then just as the applause died down, I come onto the stage like, clip, clip. <laughs> Artie's like, nice for you to join us, Arlen. <laughs> nice. Kevin, can we have a pick? Can we have a pick for Arlen? <laughs> and, uh, Did he talk like, like that? Really soft spoken? Yeah, yeah. Is that Arlen? You know, everything was like, like, no, like no stress. Let's not have any stress. Which is great. Um, yeah, even though you knew on underneath it all, it was a lot. He was boiling, probably. Oh, really? But, yeah. Uh, but it was uh, that. I love that tour because of the professionalism, the crispness of it all, the fact that we stayed in all the best hotels possible, and. Um, and the music was great. It was easy. It was uh, fun. And the group of people were just like a family. You know, I loved it. And number three? Number three in terms of what? Most rewarding? Yeah. Jeez. Um, keep it to performances. Let's keep out, you know, uh, hot legs and stuff like that. Keep it to just musical performances. Jeez. Um, uh, well, there was one performance I once did with, and this is really digging deep. But I was with Happy and Artie Traum, hmm. ironically enough, <clears throat> and we were playing Rutgers University in New Jersey, and big crowd. I mean, there must have been anywhere from two to three thousand people there. And I was having a really bad problem as a result of a cold. My ears. I was almost one hundred percent, almost one hundred percent deaf. I couldn't hear anything. There was just a little bit of sound leaking through. For some reason, I became unhinged and was able to just play to to such an extent that the entire crowd stood for me for the entire show. It's like I took over the whole show, and I had no inhibitions. I could just hear a little bit of what I was doing, but they, you know, it was just something about it that I've never, I've gotten great audience reactions. But this was like I was still like a sideman, but I would I just took over the whole thing, and I couldn't hear. <clears throat> but I just remember that being really rewarding, and that it taught me something about just being able to totally release in front of people, and that the fact that I had no hearing made me free, it kind of set me free. I wasn't responding to oh that's too loud, that's too shrill, that's what I was just boom, you know, and. The audience went crazy, you know, and um, I remember the whole band was that way. David Bromberg was there. David Bromberg got, took his guitar down, got down on his knees, and bowed in front of me on stage from the entire audience. It was amazing. And that was a long time ago. I was like 19 when that happened. And it was like a folk concert? Well, Happy and Artie Traum. You, know? I, you might call it folk, but I'm the one that kind of rock and rolled it up. Okay. Yeah. You know, I don't think we had a drummer at that point, but you know, I was playing like a 
54 Strat, you know, and, you know. Uh, um, but they were considered folk artists, but a lot of the folk artists I played with, <clears throat> it wasn't very folk when I was involved with them, like John Prine. Mm. You know. That Playing with Prine was good, but that was a rough tour. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think that, yeah, from a st performance standpoint, I mean, my God, I've been having a lot of them recently, a lot of really rewarding performances recently where it's just been, I'm sort of at a musical peak, <clears throat> and so is my band, you know, just phenomenal. Encores everywhere. And another really big peak for me was there was an old club called My Father's Place in Long Island. In Long Island, yeah, I remember that. Which is now reopening, and I'm playing there actually uh, on July 28th. It's reopening as my father's place. Yeah, but it's going to be different. It's going to be smaller, and it's going to be in a in a restored old hotel, but also in Roslyn, the same town. That's like thirty years ago that was around, right? Yeah. yeah. But I I saw when my second album became really big, it was all over WLIR. Um, as I was on my way to the gig, they said, "Turn back. There's no more tickets available." You know, they, and they said that I broke the record for selling. Uh, 1,200 tickets within like an hour, my father's place. So, and then when I got there, it was like I was just bowled over by the outpouring. You know, you don't sometimes you just don't know what it's going to be like until you walk into a place. Sure. <clears throat> that was just astounding. I must have done four encores, and it was broadcast live on the radio. There is kind of a CD, a homemade CD about it, of it floating around here and there, but. That was definitely one of my most rewarding uh, performances, for sure. Very cool. Thanks. We all pay tuition in our careers, no matter what you do. And I was wondering if you might be kind enough to share one or two mistakes you made along this journey and, and what were the lessons you learned from those mistakes? Um, gee, I don't know if I ever learned anything from all those things. <laughs> um, because I keep on doing them, keep on making them. But um, uh, I don't really know. I mean, there was, um, in the beginning, I was willing to kind of like do a lot of work for almost like nothing. You know, like I didn't understand about how to make money or negotiate about money because I was really young. You know, I was 17 and playing with people who were in their 30s and 40s. So there were a couple of... Um, albums and gigs I did and things like that where people were just somehow assuming that they were just not going to give me anything. Like you know? zero? Yeah, like zero or like bus fare. You know? For like studio, that. for session work. Yeah, for session work and for gig work too. Wow. And, you know, that was a period of like, you know, pay, definitely paying your dues, but at the same time you're thinking – is this the way it is? Like, is it, well, yeah. Know. Who do you have to ask? Yeah. Know. You know, um, and uh, so it it left a little bit of a scar with some of those people. But, I, you know, I've always been the one to always take the high road. I don't want, it, want there to be burnt bridges. I don't want there to be – because later on with those people, things became better. Things worked out. Things – matured, you know, um, and I kind of stuck with them, you know, um, I didn't, it wasn't like, oh, I'm going to get back at them or something like that. It wasn't like that. I wanted to keep my, the progression of my career, my career always in a positive light. So, um, and I knew that some of these people would just kind of fall by the wayside, you know, like maybe I'll see them again one day, but, uh, I won't hold any hard feelings, um, uh, about it. I mean, I felt really bad about what went down with the movie Crossroads when all my credits got stolen, you know. Um, what do you mean your credits got stolen? Well, Ry Cooter ended up getting credit for everything that I did. Why? <laughs> you yeah, got to ask him. That. But um, they never signed my contract. I worked seven months on the film. I recorded everything. And then when the movie came out, all of a sudden it was him playing all the things I played. I mean, did they pay you? Oh, I got paid. I got paid. So how the hell they can they? They didn't give me credit. And they didn't give me. And then from what I've been able to deduce, I can't say this for 
you know, sure. But I think that once he copied all my stuff, play everything that they erased any evidence of me doing any of that recording. Now I since have found discovered a lot of recordings that we did as we were making the film of me recording with Cooter and the original ending before there was Steve Vai and all that stuff. Um, so I have a lot of that on cassette. Some of it is just killer stuff. It's like me and Ry Cooter and Jim Keltner and Jimmy Dickinson. We're just cutting these amazing tracks. I remember one time we did this great track and Ry Cooter just said, I don't know about, I'll use that in some other movie. You know, like it was, you know, because it was just so good. He's out, oh, don't worry, I'll use it somewhere else. But uh, yeah, I. Um, so I you, under, you undervalued yourself. You didn't know how to handle the, the business end of it yeah, early and my on. Lawyer, my lawyer did a crummy job too, you know, because he could have pressed for me. But instead, they kept paying me. They kept, because you got to remember, I started by teaching Ralph for two months in his home uh, in Long Island. So I'm going along, you know, they needed me like, boom, it was like three days later after calling me, mm -hmm. I was working. So I kept on getting paid and then I kept, got paid when I was in Mississippi. I'm working on a film, paid in LA, working on everything, everything. All of a sudden, one day, I show up in the studio with my wife and daughter, baby, Jillian was just a baby, and that Cooters tells them I have to be out. I've got to be out of the studio. They're throwing me out. I said, what do you mean? Now? This is my, I'm working on this film. I'm here to see what I have to teach Ralph because there's some stuff going on musically. Well, I think what I've been able to deduce was that on that day might have been the day when he was overdubbing my parts, where he was copying my stuff note for note. This is what I've heard. <clears throat> and... You know, I got warnings from Keltner. I got warned even by the director. The director of the film warned me that that was going on. That's like conspiracy shit. That's kind of nutty. It was terrible. And that wasn't the first time I went through a thing like that. You know, but I want to. You know, but but you know, again, I just choose to take the high road. It's like, you know, Rye is going to be here in this town in on June sixth. And I've got the guitar from Crossroads, and the only the only autograph that's missing from it is his. Mm. I want to just bring it back and say, "Hey, Rod, let's get together, let's hang out, and uh, can you sign the guitar?" You know, but whatever. I mean, it's that was just that was really my mistake for not making sure that all those contractual things were taken care of before yeah. I further it all. But the direct the, the producer. Tim Zinneman would always say, oh, I, you know, I talked to your lawyer. I've got your contract, blah, blah, blah. But nothing would ever happen. Nothing would ever happen. So. Yeah, but at least, you you know, I respect you for at least saying, you know, I got to own some of this because I didn't get the paperwork. Because ultimately, it, it does come down to each of us to get that kind of stuff done. And I, so I give you respect to. Uh... Hey, but here's one thing kind of related to this. Yeah. I was really excited to be talking with you. And I mentioned to uh, another player that uh, this is, I think, before we spoke. And uh, I said, oh, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm talking with Arlen. And this apparently is a, a person, I'm not going to say who it is, that you hired. And the first thing out of his mouth is, man, that guy is a really fair business person. He does what he says he's going to do. And it was a pleasure working with him. And I'd work for him any time. Oh, so, yeah. So that's... You mean somebody who I did a video of? No, uh, someone yeah. that you, someone that's worked with you, you know, musically. Yeah. And um, I just, you know, I just wanted to pass that along because that was literally. Was he a guitar person or? Yeah, yeah. But that was literally the first thing they said. And it was like uh, really respectful, really positive. And so, yeah. you know, that's, sure. you know, that's your reputation out there, which is awesome. Yeah, it's good. It's good. It's nice. Yeah, that's that's what I sort of had planned you know i come from that kind of background with my father yeah my father was very much that way <clears throat> my mother was like oh, i'll belt him in the mouth you know that kind of thing so your mom yeah. is like super confrontational and you and you and your dad were like just it's just like, like work shit take out take off your glasses and i'll belt you one i remember her saying that to a cop nice <laughs> and oh my. The cop would just say to my dad 
move on, buddy. You got more troubles than me. You know? Yeah, yeah. But my mom was actually, she was great, you know, but she was a tough cookie. And my dad was even tougher, but my dad's toughness was in his, his um, pacifist-like manner. He could just be cool and lay back and be the artist, you know, that there was just something much more important to life than getting involved in all these scuffles, you know. Yeah. So in the end, I just want my work to speak for itself. Sure. Not people to say, oh, he was really difficult to deal with, or he was, you know, and that's, you, yeah. you don't want to, you don't want to create that static because in this business, a lot of people, they only get, you know, one time or two times to have an impression of you, you know, and they want to be left with, with uh, something good to say about you. you know? And it's a small community ultimately. It, oh, definitely. Yeah. It all comes around. People get to see each other again. Yeah. And, you know, I have no problem with taking the high road always. So the biggest mistake was not staying on top of the business end of stuff and, and not, you know, having that more organized maybe. Yeah. Well, yeah, I've never had an agent, never had a manager. Um, I always trusted people. I mean, I'd have to say that, you know, trusting too much has been maybe my biggest flaw, but at the same time, I'm not going to change myself. I'm not going to make myself somebody. Oh, now you shouldn't trust. People. You can't. Do, yeah, I know. You can't. You, that's a, that's a real big change. And that, that stems from hurt. You know, you don't want to walk around feeling hurt all the time. You want to be able to move positively. There's always going to be another gig, another session, another chance to have a, a positive experience. Sure. But it's interesting you say that those three words, don't trust, uh, don't trust people. I interviewed Dave Mason and I asked him, I think, this same question. And he looked me straight in the eye. He goes, don't trust people anyone <laughs> just like that and i was like okay i mean that's i won't say i just i was and he was like like you know i, I had like nothing to say. i couldn't i was like man i i can't comment on that that's like a therapist uh shit to work out not for me you know <laughs> i used to play a club in new york called jp which was a, a music biz hangout but because there were so many music biggies that hung out there you literally had to pay to play there <laughs> I was with a guy, Tony Bird, uh, uh, an African musician, who I played so good with him. I learned so much playing with him. And then when I walked off stage, there's Dave Mason in the corner. He goes, nice guitar. <laughs> and that was it. You know, those, those English guys, they're, they're too much. You know, But I love, I love that whole crowd. You know, he's saying I would hang out with Robin Trower and People like that, or great, great people. Yeah, what a guy! What a, what a player that guy is! Wow, a lot of respect for me. Mm. A lot of respect, you know. Hey, so if you can go back and give advice to to young Arlen Roth, assuming young mm -hmm. Arlen Roth would have listened, what advice would you have given yourself? Don't trust anybody. No. <laughs> <laughs> that was the question, actually. That I asked him. Don't trust and, those people. That's just the question. That, that was all the question. People that you're going to come in contact with the rest of your life, don't trust. Them. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was what he said, basically. Yeah, I, I don't know. I um, a lot of it, I really would have done exactly the same way because the experiences were so rewarding for me. Because I'm the type of person that really takes it all in and absorbs it and and has the great stories. Um, I don't think I really would have changed too much. I think I would have maybe it was hard because I started so young, mm. you know, like um, I was I moved to Woodstock when I was eighteen, you know, left school for that because I knew I really wanted to be off in a musical career. and um, a lot of things at that point would would um, fall apart. You know, they didn't, they, they didn't last. I'd have to go back home to New York. Um, people think, like, I've lived in Woodstock, like, ever since. I was like, no, I was in Woodstock for one year. I didn't have a driver's license. I, you know, it, it was a rough thing. I had a hitchhike everywhere. And the band that I went up there to join uh, disbanded within a couple of months. So, but I started getting work. You know, everybody wanted me, and um, I always knew that the real um, 
word of mouth and that kind of thing and making an effect on an audience that that's what would would last you know the right gig at the right time kind of thing um but yeah i don't know i i don't it's very hard to say i think i would have had my try to have my act together a little bit more from the standpoint of management hmm. and all that but it was hard it was hard for me to find people it really was it wasn't uh, I was always envious of John Prine and Steve Goodman, because they had my good buddy Al Benetta. He was their manager, and Al Benetta would like take a bullet for you. You know, you couldn't get him to work with you. No, well, he signed me to his label. He had a Blue Plate Records, Oh Boy Records, and they did um, my Touring Around album. Now that was my first one that had a lot of artists on it. With mm. 1989 to 93. And he was great. I mean, I loved Al. Al was just the best. But he would still help you. He wouldn't manage you, but he would still do things to help you. And he would, of course, advise me all the time and stuff. But he was just a character. We just loved hanging out together. And, you know, it's the rewarding um, relationships with people. And that's probably the best thing of all that occurs uh, in, a, in a business like this. I mean, to be able to do this new album, The Telly Masters, and have these guys walk in and out, one after the other, and show that deep respect, it, it blows my mind. You know, like Steve Warner, you know, Vince Gill, all these people lining up to play on it. You know, Brad Paisley could have said no. Sure. But Brad Paisley instead learned every note and lick on that song. And, you know, so it's like... Uh, that's a great feeling and then you know that every time you do something positive like that it's going to lead to an, another positive thing yeah another door opens down the line yeah absolutely, absolutely. yeah that is really true when you if, if it's done like organically and the universe kind of supports it like that then definitely other stuff happens yeah it still boils down to the contact between you and that other person you know and um what does it evoke in their minds what does it evoke in your mind all of a sudden, there's this matching, this meeting of, of talent and meeting of minds, and you never know what could grow out of that. Yeah. Um, but I could always tell that they all come in, if they don't know me, they all come in with a semi-preconceived notion of what I'm going to be like, and then it all changes. Yeah. Jack Pearson uh, and, and, you know, all the others, but... You know, Warner's like, man, it's like we've known each other our whole lives. You know, you just pick up the guitar, boom, 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 you're speaking the same language. Yeah. Great, great people. And Cropper, working with Cropper, just just amazing. I mean, these are all, all wonderful people, and there's a reason that they've stayed so good in the business for a long time, because they yeah. have that positive approach, too. They may have screwed a few people along the way, but at this <laughs> point, they're, they're okay. You know, they they They've stood the test of time. Sure, sure. Important. Let's talk about gear just for a few minutes. What's your go-to guitar? And and what other two guitars might round out your top three? I shudder to ask how many guitars you have. But just um, uh, keep, stick to electrics. Electrics. My go-to, well, my go-to for years was uh, my 53 Tele, which I still have. In fact, Fender used it as a template with some of their reissues. They they got a hold of my guitar and they borrowed it. I was like, "Oh boy, I hope I get it back." You know, it's a butter I, it's a the butterscotch with the black. Yeah, black card fifty three, yeah. all original. And uh, then I retired that once I started getting other guitars. But now, my go to is is. Pretty much a replica of that guitar, which is a Nacho caster, built by Nacho Banos of Spain. He did that big black guard book, Telecaster book. So I have serial number one. Wow. Right? And they, they brought it to me. A friend of his brought it from Spain and put it in my hands. He said, here, this is a gift to you. And ever since then, well, I think it's been about uh, seven or eight years. Um, it's been my number one go-to telly. I used it on that whole album. I use it in all my live shows. Um, I also have a beautiful, there's a new signature model for me by Delaney Guitars. 
What's it? D-E-L-A-N-E-Y, Delaney. Um, they did an Arlen Roth signature that's like a, a takeoff on, it's sort of like you blend a telly with a Strat with a Les Paul. Where are they, they out of? They're out of Austin okay. now. They used to be out of Georgia, now they're out of Austin. They do a wonderful guitar, so that's one of my go-to guitars. And for slide, I have, um, there are two. There's um, a, a Terraplane steel guitar, you know, um, not like a national steel, built by Mark Simon, Mark Simon Guitars in New Jersey. And it's, it's largely, it's largely my, um, sorry about that. It's largely my my design. It's got like a lot of innovations, but then he built it out of brass and, and silver. It's unbelievable. So I use that, and then I have um, a Harmony electric guitar that has the, has an Oahu uh, lap steel pickup in the in the bridge position. So I use that for slide also a lot, and that's just a killer slide guitar. But Mark Simon is building me a new signature model called the Rocket ADA. And that's going to have that same kind of like a Hawaiian pickup in the bridge situation. And then um, a, a gold foil in the neck position. And he's going to kind of surprise me with the shape and everything. But that's going to be probably end up being my go-to guitar. For slide. For slide. And my lap steel, go to, I have a lot of lap steels. But my number one go-to is my EH-150. I have a mid-30s Gibson EH-150. Mid-30s? Wow. Mid -30s, that's yeah. really old. Well, it was done at the same time as the ES-150. You know, you had a 150 guitar, which is the Charlie Christian guitar. The 150 Hawaiian guitar, which has the Charlie Christian pickup as well. And then there was even a one a mandolin, and then there was a tenor guitar as well, all from the '30s that had that you know Charlie Christian thing. That's old, man. That's almost a hundred years old, right? Well, Eighty-seven or you know eighty-something years old. Yeah, yeah. So That's it's old. like, and my, and my go-to acoustic. Oh, you want to do just electric? No, no. You could say you could talk about you could talk about. I mean, your Santa too. Cruz uh, made an has made an Arlen Roth triple O, like an OM style, that I love. Uh, that one's getting worked on again now. It kind of like is breaking on me, so they're doing some restoration with that. Um, but I have a beautiful. Uh, it's Thompson. It's Preston Thompson guitars out of Oregon, and I have a. a an OM um, model from that Brazilian Rosewood. That's just an unbelievable guitar. And my, my Gibson J185 from 1951. Um, you know, I have this beautiful Mahogany Martin, a 0017 from 1957. That's also just great. So, you know, I, I like to go into the studio, of course, with like a lot of guitars. If I'm doing my own work, yeah, and um, well, I would say those are my most go-to ones. With Sebastian, I've been playing a a red, um, a Guild Nightbird. What is that? Beautiful bird. It's it's kind of like a Les Paul shape, okay, but it's chambered inside. It, it was originally designed by George Bruin. Okay, great guitar. And John always says, "Please bring the Nightbird. I want you to play that." I think also because it brings up Zali, you know, like Zalianovsky. Zali always played a, a guild, I guess it was a guild Thunderbird or something. R remind me who that is again. We talked about it. Zalianovsky, the, the lead guitar player of the Love and Spoon. Player. Okay, right, right. He was a very mutual, great player. And, uh, you know, just, you know, tellies. I, I, have a, I have a Red Rocket called Red Rocket is the maker, but it's green. And it's a Kelly with, with Gretsch pickups and a gold Bigsby. So I have a couple of numbers in my show where I need that Bigsby sound, that kind of spaghetti western kind of thing. And I use that guitar, you know. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, the go-to and my 54 Strat.
you know. Um, oh, I just got a wonderful 55 Les Paul special, a flat top Les Paul. You just so got it, like, like, you know. Just got it. I just traded a few guitars for it, and I performed with it the other night. And I said, "This one's obviously going to be a keeper." You know, that's with the single so, pickup. That was a P, single P ninety in there. Um, double, double, okay. double. There was a special. I, I think the Les Paul Junior. Junior, I'm thinking of. Yeah, I'm thinking of the Junior. Les Paul special. That's really cool. And I like it. It's like the answer to the the telly. It's like Gibson's answer to the telly. Right. You know? Great guitar. So. Hey, I'm going to ask you two more questions, and I, I really appreciate uh, your time and all your stories. Sure. I, I could literally like spend a couple of days with you here. Well, we'll do that book. <laughs> Any hobbies or interests outside of music? Of course, yeah, the vintage cars. I'm a collector. Uh, of course, photography was always a big thing for me. In the beginning, it was kind of like, you know, in it, the battle was between whether I was going to become a photographer. Hmm. As an artist photographer, you know, or a musician. But uh, I've stayed with the photography, and also I love the aesthetics of, of driving the vintage cars, you know, and restoring them and, and doing all that. And, you know, they kind of come and go as to what I can keep and what I can't keep. Um, but the vintage car thing is a big, big hobby of mine. Uh, not so much working on that, you know. Because Danny was always showing me how his thumb was black, and Jeff Beck would show me how his fingers were black from smashing him with a hammer. Yeah. I'm like, well, why are you doing that? You played the guitar, you know. So I, uh, but they like working on them. I'm not like that. I don't like fiddling with electronic and, and, and mechanical things. I prefer them to just be working right, and I let somebody else do that. You know, it probably makes it a little bit more expensive. I wish I was the kind of guy that could work on all those things, but I never, I didn't apply myself to it, and I, I came to the whole thing late, hmm. you know, later in life. So, so you just like I to take that. a car out and drive it and relax, and, and then drive it. And it's an aesthetic experience. It's just like playing a vintage guitar, hmm. you know. And you, you, you drive in that car, you turn on that big tube radio, and listen to AM, and um, and then you just keep going. You know, I no idea who this is. But anyway, so yeah, so and I go to car shows, you know, and but also just cruise around, just using, you know, use them as my daily driving sometimes. Yeah. Man, you know what road I used to love in Connecticut when I lived up there was that Merritt Parkway. It was just such a sweet, um, nice drive. And that's where my family was killed. So. Oh man, sorry. Well, I never go on the Yeah, I, I can understand that. Never. I haven't been on it since, maybe for just one mile, and that was accidental. Yeah. Well, I've never gone on it since they were killed there, and there's a huge amount of people that have been killed on the Mary Parkway. It may be pretty, and it may be all that, but it was built back in the '30s when cars were different. Mm. It was built for a different time. Not all these lunatics driving BMWs going 100 miles, yeah. miles an hour. No. And Arlen, one last question. What do you think has been the biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years? And how much of this change has been deliberate and intentional? And how much <laughs> is just a natural part of aging? Well, I don't know if it's aging. It's certainly not deliberate or intentional. I don't... I, find it pretty hard to change your personality deliberately. But um, I think that I've just become a little bit more, hopefully a little bit more um, accepting of things and not as stressed out by things, especially in the music world. Kind of take it as it comes and at the same time um, take charge a little bit more. You know, again, it's like I love to lead, I love to lead a band, but I don't lead a band in a in a. I, I have musicians who I trust. Sure. You, know, you kind of nudge people in the right direction. Sometimes you say, "Oh, by the way, that chord is such and such," but you get the players that you trust, and then you just have a good time playing. Mm. Um, it's not like other gigs I've had where they've been like, you know, the leader is like a real indoctrinarian who has to like lay down the law no matter what no matter what you play like 
he's going to make you play a different way. Sure. You know, I can't, I can't do that with people. You know, I'll get the right people for the right job. But I think I've become a much better leader of others, a much better leader of bands, of other musicians, and of handling handling those situations. You know, uh, and I guess that's also coming from being a side man to reaching the forefront. You know, coming into the forefront, you've got to be a little different. That's why if I get a chance to be a side man. Once in a while, I'm like, oh, thank God, this is what I, what I really put my teeth on because I don't have to be up there at the front of the mic and I could just really express the song. And it was, I learned so much by being that side man. Hmm. You know, that's really where I, where I learned my craft. You know, so um, it's a lot, there's a lot, of, a lot of that history there. You know, there's so many great stories and so many unbelievable experiences and the, the kind of things that stay with you that other people could never even express a certain just certain little moments you know that that occur you know going way back i mean to being like in fourth grade and taking a violin solo and there was this teacher that i loved and she said where did you get that beautiful vibrato and i'm like oh that's vibrato huh and, <laughs> I, I melted. It's like, oh, she said she noticed that I had beautiful vibrato. It's like that one little moment that gave me, you know, so much encouragement. Yeah. Because I still hadn't stepped back to listen to what I was doing. So, you know, that was that, those kind of things. When you need them, they, sometimes they're right there at the right time. Yeah. I mean, I, I can't thank you enough. I want to just tell people how they, what you got going on and um, how they can get a hold of you. First of all, you got Telemasters coming out really soon, correct? Or, yeah, probably about two weeks, two or three weeks from now. Okay. So go to ArlenRoth.com. It's A-R-L-E-N-R-O-T-H.com, and you can pre-order it on there. I think by the time this out, it'll be time right for the pre-order. And yeah. Also, and that's, you want to talk about that album? Sure. I mean, uh, that, that album, you know, it materialized really as a follow-up to my Slide Guitar Summit, which was from 2015. But that was like me and all the great slide players doing duets. Hmm. Uh, Leroy Parnell, Johnny Winter, Greg Martin of the Headhunters, Cindy Cash Dollar on Steel, David Lindley, um, people like that. And Jimmy Vivino did a great job. Um, I think I had like about nine players on that album. So then I said, you know what? They call me master of the Telecaster. I think there's a lot of masters of the Telecaster who all deserve to be on this album. And in fact, we dedicated it to the the original masters, you know, like Danny Gatton and Roy Buchanan and Jimmy Bryant and Albert Collins, people like that. So um, the album is just wonderful. I mean, most of it cut live in Nashville in the studio, you know, with Steve Warner, Johnny Highland, Steve Cropper, Jerry Donahue, um, a few other people that played live on it, you know, there. <laughs> Somebody's home. And um, uh, that was all, that was really rewarding. And then there were a few tracks that had to be done from a distance, like Albert Lee, you know, uh, Bill Kirchin people like that, and, um, you know, even even uh, Will Ray, he had to do his as a later overdub. Brad Paisley, Vince Gill, obviously. But, um, yeah, we I went for some really classic tunes. Sorry, I'm shaking the brain. Classic tunes. My daughter, Lexi, sang on um, uh, Tennessee Waltz, which came out beautiful. And... Um, you know, I, I dug deep for some really old songs, and plus there's about four or five on there that I wrote. Cool. So, but it's very, some of it's very high energy, and some of it's real laid back and soulful. I didn't want it just to be about a million notes with Telecaster players just whacking all, all these notes, you know. We got some tasteful players on there that can play fast but play melodic, too. Yeah, oh yeah, Brent Mason, he did a great job. And yeah, some really cool stuff. Really. And sometimes I would write a piece like going back to my original tooling around album where I would write a piece specifically for that artist. 
that I would think would push them in, a, in a, maybe a new direction. Like I did that with Dwayne Eddy on, uh, on Tooling Around. And that song actually ended up becoming sort of like a hit. Um, but I, I said, Dwayne, you're going to play blues. It's going to be a blues thing for Dwayne Eddy. And it worked out great, you know. So sometimes it's the opposite of what they're used to being used for that will bring out something different in them. So, you know, that's me acting as a little bit of a producer. Sure. As well as a, a, a songwriter and as well as the artist, you know. I'd like to, I look to look at the overview. You know? Awesome. Everybody check out Telemasters and go to ArlenRoth.com to pre-order it. You're also working on uh, something with John Sebastian? Yep, we're doing a duet album, which was something I also, I kind of approached him about maybe three or four years ago with and he loves the idea and so we're working on that a few things of his are going to end up being instrumental some of them are going to be uh you know just me and him without a band some of it with a band uh but i'm calling it loving that spoonful cool name and it's uh it's it's we're taking his spoonful songs and uh you know, not so much reworking them, but just doing them as they kind of stand now, you know. Um, and I grew up loving his music, and Sebastian's just phenomenal. So we're, we're doing that. That, that. That's pretty close to being done now, too. Is he living in your area? He lives in Woodstock. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's great. And also, uh, please check out allinroth.com so you can come support Arlen. All his shows are on there. Your website's really good, actually. Uh, pretty Finally, th- seven years to get it up and up and running the right way. It's pretty thorough. Uh, so go. Uh, he's got all his dates. He's got a ton of ton of shows listed on there. And uh, check out Lexi Roth on her YouTube channel. She's got a lot of cool music videos. And also, I know your schedule is full, but Arlen does take on some students as lessons. If you yeah. are serious about that, go to his website at arlenroth.com and fill out the contact form and uh, take lessons with uh, one of the best Telecaster players around. Man, I, thank you so much for everything. I really appreciate it. Any final thank words you. of wisdom, man? Just to keep tuning in. No, for, well, uh, words of wisdom. Just, you know, I I feel that Doing it the hard way, which is how I did it, is in a way kind of like the only way. That to, to learn in front of people, to go out in the public, put yourself out there. Don't keep woodshedding to, for time immemorial. Get out there, have the confidence, because I knew when I started jumping up on stage with people in Woodstock and I was such a little teenager, I already knew that I had something different to offer. That if there were the right ears listening, that they would, you know, would capture that. And next thing I know, I was getting phone calls from this one and that one. That there was a way of, of um, connecting with people musically. If you hold back and you don't, because that, that put me on a whole life. Right. Of being on the road and being, I remember when I got the word that I got the John Prime tour. That was such a big deal to all my music friends. They were like, Congratulations! You're going to be part of the LA scene, the this, the that. You know, like of course that never happened, but but it, but it meant a lot. I realized that these, you know, each gig has its own meaning, its own weight, and it and its own part of your story as you move on. You know, just always try to take the best from each gig, even if the gig is a hateful gig and you can't stand the music. And I've had some of those. You got to be able to find the good within it. You know, you got to find the good. Find something about it that's helping you grow as a player, because inevitably it will. You know, even if you're playing a bunch of Neil Young songs for like five people in a in a in a bar, you know, there's something of you that you could put in there and get to the essence of why it, why the hell is that song even listened to in the first place. Not about playing note for note, but about playing it your way. Mm. You know, that's what I always insist on. So, well, thanks, man. It makes your life a lot easier finding the good in anything, anyway. It's a lot less stressful. That's very important. Yes.
Well, hang on there while I wrap up. Uh, everybody, thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as I did. I think this will be to be continued at some point in time. I want to thanks again to Arlen Roth for being so generous with his time and so freaking cool and sharing all these awesome stories and um, being really reflective and transparent uh, about you. Yeah. Thank Go you. To, you're welcome. Thank you, man. Go to everyonelovesguitar.com, sign up and get on our newsletter and get some uh, early product announcements as well. And most important, remember that happiness is a choice, so choose wisely. Be nice, go play your guitar, and have fun. Till next time, peace and love, everybody. I'm out. We hope you enjoyed this show. If you did, subscribe to the Everyone Loves Guitar podcast, and you can do this online at everyonelovesguitar.com or on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave us a five-star positive review. The more five-star reviews we get, the higher our show ranks, and higher rankings mean we get to continue speaking with cool, interesting guests on our show. We'll see you on the next episode, and until then, keep playing your guitar and have fun making music.